A Ray Davis breakout performance, another week of Tyrone Tracy as a starting running back for the New York Giants, and two massive wide receiver trades. What more could we ask for, Hayden? Yeah, and the timing's perfect, too. The one show I'm going to do this week is we get news for two of the biggest trades in season that I can kind of remember. Yep, it's massive. Maybe even fantasy landscape sweeping and changing. We'll get into all those. Again, this is Stats versus Film, where we take everything that just happened in week six, look at the film, look at the stats, then try to answer everything that we can ahead of week seven for you to win your matchups in that week and beyond. And as Hayden mentioned, Devontae Adams on the move, Mari Cooper on the move. We're going to start with those two trades and also the fallout from the teams that they just left. So let's kick things off with the New York Jets. First of all, the compensation that the Jets gave up. It's a conditional third round pick that can move into a second round pick if Devontae Adams is a first team or second team all pro or on the active roster for the ASC championship game or the Super Bowl. That seems very unlikely. So Hayden, I think we can just put this down as a third round selection in the future for the Las Vegas Raiders. Your reactions to this move? Well, it makes Mike Williams expendable. So we'll see if he gets traded shortly as well. But I thought last night, even though that they lost, I thought the Jets offense looked the best it had uh, in the last couple of weeks. The offensive coordinator change, I thought really made a difference. They were able to run the ball. They got Garrett Wilson going, Al Lazard, of course, on the Hail Mary. So everything was kind of cooking, except when they got into the red zone, they could not finish drives. But I think like the big part here is just Devontae Adams' chemistry. And I think that's going to be really important pre-snap. There were some times throughout the season where Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers were just like barely not on the same page. When the Jets need somebody before the snap, they can turn to Devontae Adams. If they need somebody a little bit more after uh, the play breaks down, Garrett Wilson's going to be the the more um, explosive type of player. So I like the dynamic here. And I, I'm just kind of curious what the fallout is going to be because I think there's going to be one more move to make. So just from a big picture standpoint, I totally agree with you that on Monday Night Football, this offense looked better, more effective and efficient than we'd seen it in weeks, especially compared to the Minnesota Vikings game, which does make sense when you consider what the Broncos and Vikings did to Aaron Rodgers in the previous two weeks, where it was tons of blitzes, tons of pressures. They, I believe, were first and second on blitz versus pass rate in the league. Uh, the Buffalo Bills were 30th. So they were just yep. not going to send that much. Now, that's not to say Aaron Rodgers had perfectly clean pockets either because we've seen Tyron Smith age catch up to him and so on and so forth. So both of those dynamics versus pressure and then also when not blitz and still pressure getting home are two that we need to keep an eye on moving forward. But we did see a Todd downing vacation of this offense a little bit yep. where the Jets use motion and shift on 73% of their plays in week six prior to the snap. That's the seventh highest of week six. That number is at 46.5% in weeks mm -hmm. one through five, which is 30th in the league. And what we've known about Aaron Rodgers is he wants everyone to just be settled prior to the snap. And he believes that he can just pinpoint where the gaps and who to throw the football to based on leverage, based on that pre-snap to post-snap read. Whereas the rest of the best offenses in the league utilize pre-snap and shifts to create the leverages to, to, confuse defensive backs and coverages with responsibility, so on and so forth. So to me, what's made Aaron Rodgers so good in his final few years in Green Bay was he and Matt LaFleur kind of met themselves in the middle, right? Now, with Aaron Rodgers in New York, small sample, it was an Aaron Rodgers offense, and that was it. So maybe, I don't know how they did in just one week, but maybe we are getting more of a meet in the middle standpoint mm -hmm. where we're getting a, a modernized version of what Aaron Rodgers does best. And the other thing that happened with the coordinator change, Brees Hall season high in snap rate as well. We actually saw Brees Hall with some uh, yards before contact, which was uh, a change as well. So we saw like kind of like the run game mirror, the pass game. And then obviously Aaron Rodgers made a couple uh, huge throws down the field. So, this is going to be, I think, maybe a little bit frustrating for fantasy just because we're turning into like a little bit of like the 49er situation where we have so many superstars in an offense that can be really uh, balanced, can be really slow paced with Aaron Rodgers, the way that he likes to play. And the Jets defense still can be really good at times. So I think that these guys are going to be a little bit more boom bust than we kind of wanted. I would move Garrett Wilson down the rest of season rankings. Devontae Adams, I would move up just because this offense, I think, will be one of the better units across the league. But I think it could be a little bit of 
Devontae Adams balls out one game, then, then it's Garrett Wilson. I think Alan Lazard is going to be kind of annoying there. And then Brees Hall, I think eventually will start scoring some touchdowns here. So I think maybe a little bit more boom bust, but this Jets offense, I can see them kind of flirting with like top eight uh, production down the stretch. If you want to support us, the best way of doing that is to go play on Underdog and use promo code the show or click the link in the description down below. As I say in every single episode right now, it is Boostober. That means free things for you. Every single day around lunchtime, they're going to throw boosts and specials on Major League Baseball, on I believe the WNBA is still going on, obviously NFL stuff, college football, so on and so forth. So you can do Battle Royale drafts every single week if you have that draft itch. You can go and play pick them with your state allows it again that is underdog that is boostober and the best way of doing that is to use promo code the show and play and once again with ray gq on these rankings episodes we've been doing a nice job on these pick entries and we're going to be playing those so get ready for it and go and play with us i think on last week's show when robert sala was fired i mentioned that i thought that was more likely that they make the move for Devonte adams because if Joe Douglas, who is also on the final year of his contract as general manager, had any other levers to pull, it was to make this trade because mm-hmm. you have to make it run the playoffs in order to save your job. Now, I understand Woody Johnson is taking credit for it. And obviously, a, a lot of money happens when and exchanges hands when you're, um, let's say, making these deals at a higher level. But to me, from a pure football standpoint, I love this. Like as an entertainment standpoint, I would much rather see Devonte Adams on the New York Jets yes. with Aaron Rodgers with with Garrett Wilson than just floundering around in mm-hmm. in Las Vegas. But as you said, there are fantasy takeaways from this. You just mentioned how you would elevate demote whatever these mm-hmm. wide receivers. I mean, right now, Al Lazard is this team's leading point getter with 13.1 points as the wide receiver 14. Uh Devontae Adams is wide receiver 24, has not played in three weeks. And then Garrett Wilson is at wide receiver 16 at 12.8 points. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, and this is after he just had two fantastic weeks at 22 and 21 fantasy points. Just my brain immediately goes back to the connection that Aaron Rodgers had with Devontae Adams back inside the red zone, inside the 10 yard line. To me, that's going to take away things from Garrett Wilson. To me, that's even going to take away things from Brees Hall. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not as simple as we can pound the rock in this area. I know Braylon Allen has even taken some of those opportunities too. So it's going to be a better offense. It's going to be one with more playmakers. I do believe, and this is maybe a dumb, simple brain take that Devonta Adams is just going to enter this offense as the primary pass catching option. That's what I think. I think it just goes back to before the snap. I think that the chemistry is like too much to overcome for Garrett Wilson. And also the red area. That's where Devonte Adams was always like leading the NFL and targets down there. And I think that Garrett Wilson, he's a fantastic player. We saw him score a red zone touchdown this last game. But I do think that Devonte Adams size is going to be the difference maker. So I would say like, without actually sitting here and making the rankings, Devonte Adams, like the wide receiver 12 rest of the season, Garrett Wilson, like the wide receiver 14, I think it's going to be pretty close between those two. And then Al Mazard, more of like in the wide receiver forties. Again, Lazard's production, a a couple of those targets were definitely the pre-snap looks that we talked about in previous shows. Obviously you get bailed, bailed out with the Hail Mary in this last game. And then Mike Williams, I think will get traded. And if he does not get traded, I think that he's just going to be like five snaps per game, but that's an expensive five snaps per game. So I do think he will be on the move pretty shortly. One year, $10 $10 million with 8.6 of that guaranteed for Mike Williams. Shout out mm-hmm. to you. That's a big W. That's a big W to get paid. For but for one but with him, that. the Jets are eating a bunch of that that money. So a team oh, that doesn't have a lot of caps cap space could trade <laughs> for him. So like teams like the Saints and the Chiefs that are pretty tight against the cap, they could make a move for Mike Williams because the Jets have already dished out the money. Yeah, I'm just looking quickly. My favorite stat, the red zone touchdown success rate of the New York Jets right now they're 18th in the league at 53%. So hopefully that is one area that can continue because mm-hmm. this team doesn't run with a lot of pace. You know, they're yeah. kind of slow and methodical and Aaron Rodgers being the ultimate point guard, which now it's going to be even better for him to do that. So jumping up from, I don't know, 53% red zone touchdown success rate to around 68%, which is where the mm-hmm. Buffalo Bills or the Minnesota Vikings are at would make a massive, massive difference for this team. Okay. Let's quickly go on the opposite end of this. The Las Vegas Raiders. We know that their season's basically over. It was Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell and then Zamir White to Alexander Madison, so on and so forth. They are just 
no playmakers, including now Christian Wilkins out for the season two, most likely. So what, what do you want to say about them just moving forward? This season was going to be a waste even before it got started. Like that's what happens when you have Garrett uh, Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell as your quarterbacks. And I think just going back to the original Devonte Adams trade, you don't trade uh, a ton of draft capital for the right to pay premier players at, at league uh, setting money when you don't have the surrounding talent. They just did that uh, with Devonte Adams. Now they have to trade them and they never really won with Devonte Adams. So really frustrating for your Raiders fans. Another reset year for them. The immediate takeaway, there's two of them. Number one, Brock Bowers, he's already established as as one of the best tight ends in the NFL, even though he's a rookie. It's only been a month and a half here. He has on-off splits with Devontae Adams, 11.3 expected points in the games without Devontae Adams. I think that number is going to increase even more, and I think that he has a chance to be uh, somewhere in the mix with Kelsey and uh, Kittle for like tight end one overall down the stretch here. They have nobody else to throw the ball to especially when Jacoby Myers dealing with that ankle sprain. But Jacoby Myers is also going to be somebody heavily, heavily involved. He also had some on-off splits. So that, I think the ball is just going to go to those two guys, and I think those two guys are going to be every week starters. Yeah. Brock Bowers' stuff is going to be bananas. And if you go mm-hmm. back and actually watch his stuff, he was a legit wide receiver in this yeah. game. I mean, they yeah. they used 12 and 13 personnel, but he was rarely attached to the the line of scrimmage. And when he was, it was chip and release and then get onto his routes. Mm-hmm. There are so often that they're basically running two wide receiver routes with one guy on one side and him on the other, and then asking him to win in man coverage. Uh, that's usage. You don't Rare. get nearly yeah. anywhere else at the tight end position. And yeah. that's awesome for us. Uh, I know that he had weeks of tight end 15 and tight end 23 stuff in weeks three and weeks four. Other than that, it's been tight end five, tight end four, tight end two, and tight in eight stuff. So uh, yep. yeah, keep it up. It's the Rams this week too, which was the team that was trying to trade for him on mm-hmm. draft night and can't guard anyone. So Brock yep. Bowers to the moon this week. Definitely so. And then, yeah, quickly on, on Jacoby Myers, he's he's just somebody that like has earned a bunch of targets on bad teams previously. And he's been a wide receiver three. Uh, I think that he's going to be locked into like starting lineups for the rest of the season as well. Buffalo Bills made a big move. Let's bring it up here. One sec, since I have to find this. <laughs> Buffalo Bills made a big move by everyone's reporting. The Bills are trading for Browns wide receiver Amari Cooper. They are sending a sixth round. Excuse me. Let me redo this ways. Three, two, one. Buffalo Bills made a big move trading for Amari Cooper. Buffalo gets Coop plus a six round pick in 2025. Cleveland Browns get a third in 2025 and a seventh in 2026. Uh, one, how dare they push the Ray Davis propaganda down about five minutes in this conversation. <laughs> right. But two, I understand that ESPN has charted in their analytics with Amari Cooper literally being the worst wide receiver in the league. To me, that is such a team stat. And we are about to see how much environment plays a part in just average to above average to maybe even good uh, wide receiver play. I'm not saying as an individual, Amari Cooper has been outstanding this year, but I also believe that we can factor in a whole bunch of things with understanding that you're playing with Deshaun Watson on a weekly basis, where maybe your best outcome and your best performance is not going to be put in a football Mm -hmm. field because of that. Yeah, if you guys have worked somewhere where you didn't want to actually show up to work and your performance declines, that's understandable. I think that's exactly what happened with Amari Cooper. The Bills really needed to make this move. Keon Coleman, just like not uh, a first round caliber wide receiver on the perimeter in the way that he's being used right now. Same thing with Matt Collins, MBS. They need an outside guy because Khalil Shakir, he's an underneath manufactured touch type of player, yards after the catch threat. But Dalton Kincaid has not shown enough uh, difference making ability for the Bills to be taken seriously as Super Bowl contenders. So they needed Amari Cooper, somebody to win on the perimeter, down the field. Uh, and I think that Amari Cooper is going to look a lot better in Buffalo than he did in Cleveland. Lots of drops this year did not look as fast on tape. Uh, so it's not a surprise that like some of the advanced numbers don't look very kind to Amari Cooper, but all of a sudden now you have Josh Allen, you're fired up to play. You're going to be playing important football down the stretch. Uh, I think that Amari Cooper is going to be somebody probably go a wide receiver three to start with some upside um, because they do spread the ball around. They can run the ball a ton, but man, there's going to be some weeks where Mark Cooper can really get going. So I think net positive for a Mark Cooper in fantasy. 
This gives them an actual route runner on the outside, which yes. they did not have with Keon Coleman, who was glued to the sideline and Matt Collins. And I understood it somewhat on a team building level where if you're going to play efficient football and really run the ball, which we'll get to in a moment, then you needed bigger bodies to block. And mm -hmm. that might be a true coach speak thing but we actually see it into practice and we saw it in this game, how important that has been in other ones with the Buffalo bills. But I've just had enough of seeing Matt Collins on a weekly basis. It was like yeah. fine here as a role player, but almost as a 70% snap guy, we're done with that. So mm -hmm. to me, it's going to be Amari Cooper and Keon Coleman. And then hopefully Khalil Shakir, who I didn't think looked healthy on Monday night. He was kind of going in and out in the lineup when he did catch mm -hmm. a pass. We didn't see him like fully stride out and create after the catch, but Hayden, this destroys to me the theory of the plays of people like Don Kincaid, for example. Yeah. And sure, maybe they're going to be more scoring drives and things of the sort and just better all team success uh, with Amari Cooper in there, even though that the Bills are pretty dang good at that already. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but Dalton Kincaid's the entire theory of that pick was, hey, can he become the volume sponge in this offense? Can he potentially lead all tight ends and targets because they really didn't yep. have that guy? And to me, that is totally out the window now. Yeah, I completely agree. He just hasn't shown up enough on, on tape. So he, he can make some plays after the catch. He's made a couple plays downfield, but just really has the full package has not come together. And there's some like underlying stats with the Buffalo Bills. Like, for example, inside the 10 yard line, they're the most run heavy team in the NFL. I think that's fine when you have Josh Allen and maybe it's even better when you have Ray Davis as kind of the power runner on the team. But Come on. I mean, when you have Josh Allen, you do want to be able to pass the ball a little bit more than what the Buffalo Bills uh, were doing these last couple of weeks here. So love the move for for everybody. And yeah, Dalton Kincaid, I guess he's a low end tight end one, but he was barely holding on there. And he's like no longer part of like the elite tight end category. OK, I'm going to ask you this question and it's impossible to answer right now, but you do have to. So we look at wide receiver ones on other teams that aren't top 24 players. Okay. So like DK Metcalf right now is the wide receiver 26 in points per game. Mm -hmm. Deontay Johnson, the wide receiver 29, DJ Moore, wide receiver 30, Zay Flowers, wide receiver 31. Could you envision Amari Cooper finding himself in that zip code? Mm -hmm. Or do you think yeah. it's closer to someone that's further down the list? Because right now, like Khalil Shakir, for example, is wide receiver 39. Yeah, I think he's going to be clear the Khalil Shakir performances just because the way that they were using Shakir was like largely behind the line of scrimmage or like short uh, crossing routes. And I think that the Bills offense can do a little bit more with Amari Cooper. But yeah, those names that you listed, like DJ Moore, the, uh, like some of those wide receivers that deal with some target competition on more balanced offenses, I do think that's where he kind of slides into me. But he does need to play better. It's like Amari Cooper yeah. is actually cooked. And what we saw from this year is just like the reality of Amari Cooper in 2024. Then that's not going to work out either. So I think more boom bust wide receiver three. But for the production that we're getting from Amari Cooper on the Browns, uh, I still think that this is going to be an upgrade uh, for them. I'm not going to sit here and say Amari Cooper's been good. Uh, I also believe Jacob Gibbs pointed out that Amari Cooper had 26 catchable yards in week six playing with yeah. uh, Deshaun Watson. And the team as a whole had like 66 catchable yards in that game. So environment just plays a part I, to yep. me in all of these big picture analytics and stats mm -hmm. and metrics. And uh, it's going to be a sizable shift in my opinion. Okay. Now to the main course, Ray Davis. <laughs> The preseason crush hits in a big, big time way. James Cook does not play due to a toe injury. So we get 20 carries for 97 yards, three receptions, 55 yards, including that beautiful, let's just say textbook catch yeah, of 42 sure. yards down the field <laughs> for Ray Davis. Uh, simple question here, Hayden. Does this performance chew into the bigger, massive pie that James Cook had already mm -hmm. taken on this season that I didn't expect him to. I think so. I, I don't know why it wouldn't. They drafted Ray Davis to kind of be that Damian Harris, the Latavius Murray, all those big power backs and keep James Cook a little bit fresher where he's maybe closer to 15 touches per game. I think that uh, James Cook's going to be used in the pass game. That's where he's been really efficient. They can use James Cook on the perimeter. But as we saw last night, they wanted to get Ty Johnson the ball early on in the game. And then they said enough of that. Ray Davis has played himself. Uh, he just runs really hard. You know, he's kind of yep. got that like shorter, uh, stockier build, but he runs really, really hard. I thought that like, he looked 
a little faster than maybe what we were kind of expecting and all that's good stuff. And then he catches that pass down the field as a little bit of a cherry on top. So I think that it's going to be maybe difficult for Ray Davis to be like an every week starter, but in terms of like the handcuff ceiling, like, yeah, Ray Davis is going to be somebody that we should definitely take serious. And I do think that James cook, you might have to move him down just one tier because Ray Davis, I thought was like too good to kind of hide away. Not to put you on the spot, but do you have the running back usage charts for the entire league out there? Cause I would love to see where the Buffalo bills are just from a stylistic standpoint, thunder and lightning, a very traditional way of describing a backfield. I mean, could we not get a lesser version of, David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs here with Ray Davis and James Cook. Again, James Cook has owned this backfield. It was very cool to see him get I-10 inside the 10-yard line stuff. Now, once again, the reason why the David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs stuff works is because look at where they are in running back usage, averaging 26 backfield points per game. Uh, but the Buffalo Bills are what? That would put them almost around 14th in the league, 15th mm-hmm. in the league at 20 fantasy points. So it's midway through the pack. But to me, that would be a massive loss for what James Cook has opened up the season and would kind of transport him back to what he was last year, which was, again, a really talented runner, but more a between the 20s style. And if he loses touchdowns, that puts him back in like that running back 18, 19 range versus a top 10 score of the position. The difference between the Lions and the Bills is Jared Goff's not trucking dudes and doing Superman stuff inside the red zone. And those those rushing right. touchdowns for Josh Allen, like we saw we saw them uh, do the tush push with Josh Allen. You're not seeing J- Jared Goff do that very often. So I agree. Yeah, James Cook, I removed uh, the injured games. He's been the running back 15 or running back 18 usage this last month. Um, I think that's probably the closer to his upside. Now he can rip off a long touchdown. So James Cook's still a... a, a an every week NFL fantasy starter. But yeah, I mean, why would not give the ball to Ray Davis six, seven, eight times per game? Even if it's just like on like the it's third and one, we want to just run duo right up the middle. I think that Ray Davis may be a little bit more uh, suited for that type of role. And I'm not trying to be a hater. James Cook has not been bad this year at all. He's been the running back nine and points per game. Uh, but this was the theory of the play where I thought that, Ray Davis's running style just kind of fits where this rushing attack was going under Joe Mm -hmm. Brady. And Mm -hmm. if he got the opportunity, he was going to make good on it. And he definitely did that. So again, even just eight carries, and especially if they were in certain areas of the field that would diminish James Cook's rest of season value, but it might not like it might not happen. So Mm -hmm. we have no idea. Also real quick, Ray Davis, like such a cool story, like so easy to root for legit homeless. And now like taking it full advantage of his opportunities. And it was like the one of the first runs of the game. You're like immediately like, yep, that's that's an NFL player right there. Let's now go to the Cleveland Browns end of this equation. This was a tweet from Ian Rappaport. The Browns restructured Amari Cooper's deal before the season, making an easy contract to trade. Now he lands in Buffalo as a new target for Josh Allen. Uh, Simple question here with Cleveland. What is this offense now? Like they know it's over, yet they're going to continue to trot out Deshaun Watson on a weekly basis. For now, I, I do think that this is maybe a little bit of a signal that they are completely punting off this season and, and like their cap structure for the next couple seasons. So maybe they eventually turn to Jameis Winston. My main takeaway here is I've been promising you guys David and Joku fantasy points, and he's been dealing with some injuries. He's been dealing with Deshaun Watson, but the takeoff from this point forward for the rest of the season is fantastic. And we actually saw this late last year when they went to uh, with Joe Flacco and David Njoku finished as a tight end one overall for like the last like 12 weeks of the season. I think that we could be getting to that point very quickly. Jerry Judy's not a target earner. You can't sell me on any of these other guys, Elijah Moore, Cedric Tillman. Those guys aren't going to be in the mix. David Njoku had a season high in usage last week, even though he was dealing with two different injuries. If we do get Jameis Winston shortly, I do think that David Njoku is going to be a player that you definitely want to be trading for. And you're actually going to be thankful that you drafted, even though it's been a really slow start uh, for reasons that he had no control over. We theorized this on the instant reaction show on Sunday night. Nick Chubb may be playing as early as this week or next week. Do you think there's any chance based on how his quarterback is playing right now, based on how the season is going along, based on it being a mission impossible task, to score 20 points on offense at this point <laughs> that Kevin's a fancy just reverts back to the Baker Mayfield, Nick Chubb days. And I understand that Nick Chubb is coming off a massive injury, but yeah. going back to those run rates versus being one of the highest neutral pass rates in the league right now. 
that would just be such a huge change from like all the off season acquisitions we've talked about over like the last couple seasons. And I'm not sure if we can like trust Nick Chubb to be himself. Also the offensive line has been so bad that I think trying to run behind right. it, it's not going to be the solution either to me. Like I think the more likely scenario is just what we saw last year, change quarterback, Joe Flacco, sling the ball like crazy, see what happens. But this team's in like full rebuild mode. They extended Stefanski and GM Andrew Barry this off season. They have a long leash here. I think that they're just going to be selling assets uh, and then maybe kind of looking to get younger. Um, there's just not like a bunch of young talent either over here in in Cleveland. So it's, it's in a really tough spot. I did want to share this one uh, little chart here just to show how bad Deshaun Watson has been. This is deep target catch rate. The NFL average are around 45%. Everybody is in a tier above except Deshaun Watson down here, like at 22% of his 15 plus air yard targets uh, have been caught this season. So just beyond brutal down the field. One w- way to uh, work around that, throw the ball to David Njoku in the screen game repeatedly. That graphic was hilarious to me. I didn't want to tweet this out, but you're doing some real uh, gerrymandering line drawing there based yes. on just your personal <laughs> bias on uh, which OCs yeah. you like and which ones yes. you don't. And even though they might be in the same exact area on that chart. <laughs> yes. Just Somebody asked me, he's like, are you allowed to like just pick the play or the OCs that you like and don't like? I'm like, yes, this is literally my Twitter account. This is how this works. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you want to support us, the best way of doing that is to go play on underdog and use promo code, the show, or click the link in the description down below. As I say in every single episode right now, it is boost over. That means free things for you every single day around lunchtime. They're going to throw boosts and specials on, Major League Baseball, on I believe the WNBA is still going on, obviously NFL stuff, college football, so on and so forth. So you can do Battle Royale drafts every single week if you have that draft itch. You can go and play Pick'em with your state allows it. Again, that is Underdog, that is Boostober, and the best way of doing that is to use promo code the show and play. And once again, with Ray GQ on these rankings episodes, we've been doing a nice job on these Pick'em entries, and we're going to be playing those. So get ready for it and go and play with us. Okay, let's talk about these new starting quarterbacks across the league. Uh, Right now, Aiden, Russell Wilson is basically, albeit Mike Tomlin is not saying it publicly yet, is going to be named the starter of the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's been a unsustainable start. Let's put it that way for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Despite being four and two, they basically just are not scoring touchdowns. At one point when I believe they were, what, four and oh or three and oh, they had tied for the second lowest amount of touchdowns scored in offense in the league. Again, unsustainable things. Uh, when you saw this, what was your takeaway? It felt a week early, to be honest, but I do think that the Steelers plan going back to this offseason was always Russell Wilson's going to be the guy until he's not. And they were able to win some games against some bad football teams. Justin Fields, I thought, played admirably. He's top 20 in a bunch of the advanced stuff, EPA for play, success rate, completion percentage, overexpected Arthur Smith. I think has done a good job of working to Justin Fields strengths. He hasn't been turning the ball over, but I think if you look and watch some of the games, there have been some like turnovers that were just like strictly dropped. Uh, George Pickens has not been showing up in the box score. Some of that we'll get to in a second. George Pickens is dropping some passes, but Justin Fields, his inaccuracy is still there. He turns down some throws. Uh, and I think that there's like a cap to what the Steelers could be. So why not go to Russell Wilson for a couple weeks? If Russell Wilson's completely cooked out there, you know you can go back to Justin Fields and get at least adequate starting quarterback play. But I think that the, the Steelers are like looking for a NFL playoff level quarterback. I think you and I and most people probably don't think that Russell Wilson has that in him. But I think like Mike Tomlin, Arthur Smith, and this very conservative play action based offense can get a little bit more out of that. So I think that it's an experiment over the next month of the season. And we'll see if Russell Wilson can kind of keep the job. I'm not going to lose my mind over this. I I do believe Justin Fields played within the guardrails to open the season. And then Mm -hmm. we've even seen more offensive line injuries and the weirdness that's surrounding George Pickens. And we know the running game just hasn't gotten going on at all. And so over the last couple of weeks, some of the tentativeness that he was playing with, albeit somewhat more decisive than we saw with Chicago, has vanished and we've seen more of the playmaker style, which gives yep. you more high variance-ness both in his decision-making and his throws, but we also get rushing off of that. I will add this past week against the Las Vegas Raiders, there were a bunch of broken pockets 
and free rushers, and he was able to evade those and create mm -hmm. something. Uh, Mike Tomlin was asked about this. Hey, now I don't know if you saw this quote. Uh, he was asked if Russell Wilson has the ability to escape the rush the way that Justin Fields did against the Raiders. <laughs> Point blank, he said, no, he does not. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. and they just lost their starting center in Zach Frazier. Yeah. Um, this, we, we already know they've been losing their starting left tackle, who was a rookie or starting right tackle, I should say. Anyways, it's... <sighs> I don't know really the upside that Russell Wilson is going to give an offense here in 2024. I've, I've heard from fans out there that maybe they're proponents of Russell Wilson that well, when you package Russell Wilson's entire career, it's really good stuff. The, the let Russ cook movement in the last two years has just been real bad because he's gotten right. older. He, he can't move as well as he used to. Mm -hmm. And when you just drop your eyes and do the hokey pokey in the pocket and then launch vertical passes to right. me, that like tanks the structure and the plan of the offense. And to me, that means we're only going to get this experiment for one or two weeks if it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. it can be that quick of a hook. If, if it doesn't work. The, the stat that I, I came across is just Justin Fields play action. He's averaging five yards per attempt uh, the league average is way higher than that. And that's kind of, I think, where they're looking for Russell Wilson, where I, I agree with you, like out of structure, when the play's breaking down, Russell Wilson's not going to be providing you with that stuff. But I do think that the Steelers are looking at their team. They're saying our defense is one of the best in the entire NFL. And if we can just get some play action shots down the field to George Pickens, that's enough for us to at least be breaking into the 20 points per game conversation. So I, I'm calling this an experiment. I don't have like strong takes with Russell Wilson. If, if his calf injury is bugging him still, and he's like even less mobile, that's going to be a problem. But I do think that there was enough uh, missed throws to George Pickens this last week. I counted at least three of them where we could have been uh, moving the chain, scoring touchdowns. And I do think like that was kind of the difference for, for uh, Russell Wilson to get a shot. But I do just think the old traditional media members in Pittsburgh, this entire off season, were saying, they want sure. Russell Wilson to not just be the guy this year. He's a captain, they, is he not? Yes, they think that he can be the guy moving forward, period. So yeah. they just like have a different outlook than we do uh, from the outside. Again, my fear, coming off a calf injury, already the lack of mobility that we've seen from Russell Wilson, now playing behind an offensive line that I believe they're going to miss Zach Frazier, Troy Fatanu, and already lost James Daniels at the exact same time. So you're going to ask Russell Wilson to be more of a pocket quarterback and play on script and on schedule uh, to this wide receiver group, it doesn't look like it's good news yeah. to me, you know? Yeah. So like, I understand that in the first three weeks with Justin Fields, we had zero turnover worthy plays in the last two weeks or three weeks that has definitely changed. And that has definitely yeah. gone up. But to me and the idea of it was you can always at least coach around and with the athleticism that Justin Fields mm -hmm. brought to the table. I'm not sure exactly what you know you're getting from Russell Wilson, but we're going to find out in the next one to two weeks. Yeah, I would just say like downfield accuracy off play action. Like that's what I think that they're going to deliver. We'll see if if that's enough here. Didn't want to shout out real quick. Went back and watched this game. What was Najee Harris eating this last week to make him absolutely take <laughs> off like that? I mean, that was like one of his best games ever. And this was coming off of a brutal first five weeks of the season. Like when he turned the corner and extended for that diving touchdown, I was like, who the hell is that? So uh, shout out to Najee Harris. And then uh, other thing, like Jalen Warren, I mean, like just like not a part of the offense like at all right now. So that was kind of surprising to me. Did you make your George Pickens points? I might have tuned it out if you did. I mean, just there's a couple drops. He had one that should have been a touchdown. He had one of the most hilarious whip routes that you'll see where he ended up getting the, the first down after like a secondary move. Um, but yeah, he was just missed on a couple scramble drills and like that big crossing uh play that should have been a touchdown just justin fields like just missed him so pickens is like the wide receiver eight in expected points this month but he's wide receiver 56 in actual points because he's not playing well the steelers aren't playing well and that's why you give russell wilson a shot here no i, I mean i don't want to look at the russell wilson move through the lens of hey we got to get george pickens involved in this offense well pickens uh, might get ejected every game if he doesn't get the I know, ball that's a what i mean more. like so that's a problem i, I I mean, if we rewind back to week five, it seems like Mike Tomlin didn't want to build anything out of the George Pickens this experiment. It's true. <laughs> uh, this is just a note. George Pickens in contested catches in his first year in the league, 19 of 28 for 68%. These last two years, it's 11 of 36 for mm -hmm. 31%. Now, as John Ledger points out, this is just by the charting and the eyes of the person that's doing it at PFF. As we know, especially with draft prospects, contested targets are not equal depending on every single person who watches said contested target. But 
that one with four minutes left in the game where it was perfectly back thrown, back shoulder thrown pass. Uh, that's the play that George Pickens has to make for the score touchdown. So you can mope, you can do all this stuff and not run your routes at full speed. Then when you get your opportunity in the fourth quarter to actually score a damn touchdown and you drop it, that's on you, bud. I agree. That's on you. Okay. We had two new starting quarterbacks this past week. Let's kick things off with the New England Patriots. Drake May, athlete. It's exactly what we wanted to see. I'm just hyped that we get a player like this in the league. It sucks that he's surrounded by his supporting cast, but man, he's fun. He can be electric and he's actually going to make these games more entertaining. He's just big, powerful, and fast. And you saw some of the scrambling. You saw a couple second chance opportunities uh, for Drake May. And like that was the upside case. What we're talking about, where like in the pre draft process, when he's like, the upside case could be similar to Josh Allen. You can kind of see some of those traits in this first game that huge touchdown, one on one coverage to Kayshawn Booty uh, for a long touchdown. That was a pretty cool play. Um, and there's a couple scrambles where like he's just too big and powerful and he's going to pick up first down. That's one of the most important parts about his college profile was he scrambled a lot, but he was also yep. very efficient when he did scramble. So he wasn't doing this uh, like like to like the detriment of the team. He's picking his spots and he knows how to do it. Unfortunately, this Patriots offense is just like so bad. The offensive line's terrible. Their wide receivers were really bad. And this offense runs so many just like hitch routes. Like they're so static. There's a lack of speed everywhere. So I think it's going to be pretty hard to have a sustainable offense. But you will see some peaks from Drake May. You will also see some valleys from him because a lot of missed throws in this game. Accuracy, I thought, was a problem going back to college. And he did miss like five or six throws that easily could have been chunk gains for him. And you'll see that throughout, I think, his rookie year, maybe beyond, where yep. even some of the catches that were made were behind his pass catchers, above them, they were reaching, and that just yeah. destroys yak opportunities. And then that's not even to mention the oversale for a interception. But that, like, that's okay, you know? I don't think we're at this point where we should nitpick, you know, a rookie's first performance and say, this is just who he's going to be the rest of the way. It might change a little bit. It might not, but it might change. Um, and just the scramble rate, I think it was at 12% in this game. That's just going to give you rushing points. That's going to yep. give you rushing production. And we haven't even seen that inside the red zone really at this time. He was already the quarterback 10 and points scored. Uh, it's a very interesting one. And I want to add that if you loved Drake May to Josh Downs at UNC, you're really going to like Drake May to Pop Douglas. I don't mm -hmm. think Pop Douglas is the same caliber of a talent that Josh Downs is. No offense to Mario, but... What we are going to get is a lot of middle of the field routes in isolation in man to man coverage. He connected with one that was for a long touchdown on yards at the catch and then missed another that almost could have been another long yep. gain and a potential touchdown, too. So uh, I'm surprised you guys didn't spend a full segment on Pop Douglas in the waiver wire show. Yeah, uh, I hadn't watched the the film of Pop Douglas at that point, and I, I saw the same note that like he could have had a longer second. Uh, a touchdown if Drake may put it on him, but he's to me like easily the number one wide receiver easy for the Patriots. Like very easily uh, we're chopping names off the list. One uh, wide receiver I'm willing to chop off the list right now, Jalen Polk. He just creates no separation. Like there's just, like no pace to his game. And like in terms of his athleticism, but also just like off the line of scrimmage, there were so many opportunities for uh, the Texans. Like the Texans were, embarrassing the Patriots wide receivers by playing like cover one press man coverage, no safety help repeatedly daring these wide receivers to get open. One of them was able to do it repeatedly. That was pop Douglas. Jalen Polk dealt with a couple drops, got clamped up for the entire game. So I think that pop Douglas is going to be the wide receiver that we should trust. Everyone else becomes irrelevant. And I hopefully Drake may could uh, start converting on some of these like easy targets to pop Douglas over the middle, because I think that pop Douglas is like turning into like a, a PPR scam wide receiver, three yeah. wide receiver four, because I just don't trust any of these other cats to get open. Yeah. It's the year of the PPR scam wide receiver in pop Douglas and Wandale Robinson and Malik neighbors on top of it. So all three <laughs> of those it. guys, PPR scams. <laughs> all right. New Orleans saints also started a new quarterback. We know Spencer Rattler stepped in there. Uh, a great first half, a tough second half, Yeah, but it gets even more difficult now heading into Thursday night football for him. He's not going to have Chris Olave. He's not going to have Rashid Shahid. Just tough sledding here. But at the very least, we talk about confidence all the time with these young guys. I do believe Spencer Rattler has this confidence. Yep. And it might stem from what he's had to overcome during his collegiate career. We know he started at Oklahoma, got benched there, moved on to South Carolina, 
than a later round draft pick, so on and so forth. So he's a gamer, and I actually felt like mm -hmm. we see across the league these offensive coordinators not changing their styles based on who's at quarterback. Kubiak did even more so leaning into the movement of the pockets, the play action, getting him out in space, and letting a young Spencer Rattler mm -hmm. utilize some of his athleticism. Yeah, I saw the same thing. I think that in the early part of the game, there was less pressure on him. And you can see like the play action based offense that we wanted to see from New Orleans. But he the scoreboard got wonky on him. He throws that ball to Chris Olave, concussion, fumble six. That's not going to help him out. He had a couple plays that were called back uh, because of penalties. Uh, there was a, a key drop in there. But I think the best of Spencer Rattler is you can move him outside of the pocket. He's going to scramble around a little bit. There's nothing like crazy about his athletic traits that like pop off. I don't think like, his arm strength or accuracy is groundbreaking. But he does have that little bit of that gamer to him. So like, is he... The Taylor Heineke plus I think like that's kind of like the starting point but maybe there's a little bit more to him and I think that with Derek Carr out for the next couple of weeks we'll be able to see uh maybe a little bit more in structure stuff when you know they're not giving up 50 points on the other side but man like losing your two best wide receivers for this game yep. you're already down a million offensive linemen as well I mean he's dealing with absolutely nobody and now you have a short week against a, a, a defensive coordinator that's going to be willing to get after it. it's not going to be a pretty showing uh, for Thursday night football. This is the Nick Underhill graphic that he put out again, weeks one and weeks two were unbelievable for the New Orleans saints. Granted they played the Carolina Panthers and the Dallas Cowboys in those first two weeks. But ever since then they've lost Chris Olave, Lucas Patrick at left guard center, Eric McCoy, right guard, Cesar Ruiz, Taysom Hill, who is the entire offense at times, Rashid Shaheed, <laughs> quarterback Derek Carr, and then Alvin Kamara is apparently, once again, dealing with a hip, ribs, and hand injury. So in the year, in the weeks that we have, bye weeks, now it's only two for this week, uh, who was going to step up here? And the two names that kind of popped up, if you really are desperate to play, are Bub Means and Jawan Johnson's back in our lives. Mm -hmm. I would even go as far to say I would prioritize Jawan Johnson more so than Bub Means, um, especially considering the tight end position. He was heavily involved, a lot of middle of the field over routes. And the timing I thought between those two guys was very good. To me, Bub Means was more of, I mean, not a replaceable talent. I don't want to He's listening insult to the, the show. Guy coming He's subscribed. Off his, his, <laughs> I don't want to insult the guy coming off, you know, his best performance of his career. But it was more of uh timing based routes rather than I'm gonna create right. a whole bunch of separation mm -hmm. and beat my man in isolation. Yeah, one of my favorite plays from the Spencer Rattler, there was like a designed uh, ball to the flats. I was completely covered up. And then he goes to like the deeper concept for the, the, the touchdown. You don't see like low to high progressions, but Spencer Rattler was able to do that. Uh, we'll see if Taysom Hill plays on, on a short week here dealing with that rib injury. But like this would be the most classic Taysom Hill gets out of there with like 10 opportunities game with everybody else pretty injured. So that's kind of like the name I would be paying attention to, especially if you have like tight end eligibility in your league. The, the latest news that I've seen is from October 8th, so a week ago here on Derek Carr, that from Mike Garofalo, he's expected to miss multiple games. So I would say it was at least week six and definitely week seven, and we'll see after a bit of extended break if he mm -hmm. comes back from that. But I would just like to see Spencer Rattler for a longer period of time. I'm, I've had enough vanilla soft serve in my life. <laughs> Let's do some alphabetical order stuff. And unfortunately for us, Hayden, that kicks things off with the Arizona Cardinals. We know that Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, left this game, I believe, with concussion-like symptoms. And we've talked about this trend across the league where concussions a few years ago went from, oh, they might play that same week, it was a 50-50 rate, to last year almost certainly they're going to miss at least one game. And it almost feels like now, Hayden, we're almost to the point where it's missing two games. So that's something mm -hmm. to keep in mind moving forward. Definitely so. And then I think that Michael Wilson is going to be the guy that you're going to want to pick up if you uh, do have Marvin Harrison out there. Greg Dorch had a pretty tough outing uh, this last game, and obviously Trey McBride's going to be the guy. So there's just like not many options here. James Conner also dealing with an ankle injury. He was in and out of the lineup down the stretch. Uh, did see some Trey Benson, saw a lot more Imari Di Mercado when the game was completely over. So it was not a good showing for the Arizona Cardinals once again. But yeah, I would expect Marvin Harrison probably to miss one game here. And that means a whole ton of Trey McBride. His best game of the season, no surprise, was with Marvin Harrison uh, not on the field. Uh, and Trey McBride just owned the middle of the field. Like that was, yeah. we, we get all these, Kyler Murray doesn't like to throw the middle of the field. 
I would wager a lot of that is when Trey McBride misses games or wasn't at full strength or those types of things. Because mm-hmm. once he's there, that area of the field is attacked with mm-hmm. with Trey McBride. So I, I feel decent about the Trey McBride stuff at the moment. But yep, uh, still a long season, especially at that position. Okay, Atlanta Falcons. And by the way, with the Arizona Cardinals, since they were playing behind so much, we did get a taste in James Conner being hit or miss and those types of things. As you mentioned, DeMarcado played the entire second half. And that was ahead of Trey Benson. And so Trey Benson, to me, does not qualify as of this point. And if James Conner goes down, then backup running back, you have to have this guy. Mm -hmm. And I think people perceive that to be Trey Benson during drafts this summer. And as of this point, I definitely cannot call him that as one of the higher end handcuffs across the league. Yeah, uh, Sam and I on the waiver wire show at the very beginning of the show, we I listed like my eight like league winning waiver wire additions, like backup running backs, and I did leave Trey Benson off that list. Just a too big of a transition for how he was used at Florida State versus what the Cardinals want to do on offense. Atlanta Falcons, they are rolling and rumbling. Uh, once again, we're getting a whole bunch of slot work from Drake London, and it's fantastic stuff. Uh, and then the backfield really got rolling, shockingly against the Carolina Panthers who are giving up, I believe 25 rushing points per game at this point. Uh, So really in imperative situations and critical situations, it once again is a 50, 50 split here between Tyler Algier and Bijan Robinson, 14 carries inside the 20 for Algier, 13 for Bijan Robinson, so on and so forth. People are going to really focus in on this Hayden because, you know, in a maybe different universe, Bijan could have had three touchdowns in week six against the Carolina Panthers. Uh, To me, I am not as concerned and I'm just glad that this Falcons offense is playing to this high of a level because that gives us so much of a better outcome for someone like Mm -hmm. Bijan Robinson. Yeah, this was uh, Bijan's second career game as a top five uh, finisher at the position. So yeah, take it where you can with the Bijan wins. But Algier was being mixed in uh, at the goal line before the game was completely over here, but both running backs get there because the Panthers can't stop anybody. So yeah, I, I think the, the big takeaway is just like, this is a, a watchable offense at the, like at the very yeah. least, like that's probably derogatory for what they've been the last couple weeks. Uh, Drake London settling into that Cooper cup adjacent role. He's the wide receiver three in expected points this last month. He's the wide receiver four over that period. He actually had a season high in usage, this last week, Darnell Mooney also hanging in there, top 20 uh, in both of those same exact metrics. So, yeah, I think that this was a, a, an ass whipping for the Panthers, and we should expect that to happen every single week moving forward. Yeah, I mean, before this week, Bijan was hovering around that running back 20, running back 21 territory. And just this offense being really good, and even if that means they do split it 60-40 one way or the other, then that gives us an out for Bijan Robinson to me to be a top 15, top 12 scorer, if not even higher than that. Yeah. Uh, I really like what I'm seeing from Bijan Robinson. And this might just be more of a narrative-based thing or an anecdotal thing watching these games. But Tyler Algier is getting so much work because when he's on the field, he's doing really good stuff with the exactly. football. Yeah. And like he picks up or breaks one or two of these tackles. The entire sideline gets amped from it. And they're just like, we're just going to leave Tyler Algier in Mm -hmm. now and let him get the next five, six touches in the backfield. And that's to me, not a punishment for anything Bijan Robinson has done. It's just celebrating the good Mm -hmm. back that Tyler Algier is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's like a little like James Connor to him. So yeah, he's like just too good to completely erase from the offense. Uh, I did have two charts for you. I know that you love to, to kind of rag on Kyle Pitts. So I have some evidence uh, oh. for you just a little bit. The Falcons are number three in wide receiver usage this last month. And if you go down to the tight end chart, you can see the Falcons barely even using yeah. the tight ends uh, out there. He so did have what, a 52 yard catch or something that right. he was totally uh, uncovered. Correct. Yeah. But yeah, they keep using Darnell Mooney. Uh, Darnell Mooney's yeah. been playing pretty, pretty good football. Totally. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the one area too where the team is still yet to untap is red zone touchdown success rate. They are 23rd in the league at 45%. You know, we could get closer to, I don't know, again, the 65% stuff that Tampa Bay's at right now, who they're competing with the NFC South for Mm -hmm. at the moment. So uh, more touchdowns might mean good things for Drake London. It might mean good things for Bijan. It might mean good things for Tyler Algier. So there's still some levers to pull for this team as a whole to just score more Mm -hmm. points. Uh, We don't need as much coup in our lives for for fantasy football. (laughs) 
Baltimore Ravens. Uh, this is a team that's must watch every single Monday yeah. when you when you turn on the tape. I know you did this week. What'd you like from them? The I think the big takeaways is the wide receivers were doing real wide receiver stuff. And I say that in plural because Rashad Bateman, he's been one of the most efficient wide receivers on his targets in the entire NFL. He got open at will this last game through a couple of defensive pass interferences, but a couple nice wins against man coverage from Rashad Bateman. So obviously he's not going to be in the mix for fantasy, but I think that's good news for the Ravens as like Super Bowl contenders. And then Zay Flowers, the uh, very first drive, a huge gain off of a screen. He also has a sweep action for uh, another chunk gain, but really Zay Flowers, it was just like dig route after dig route after dig route, shallow cross, man coverage, win, 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 win. And we have we haven't really seen that from Zay Flowers consistently through the first two years of uh, being an NFL player. But I thought this was one of his best games, if not his absolute best game, doing the real wide receiver stuff. The caveat being this is the commander secondary. But uh, nevertheless, Rashad Bateman and Zay Flowers, I thought those two were the standout players uh, in this game. Yeah, this came from Dan Pizzuta's work over on the 33rd team every Monday morning. Uh, five of Zay Flowers' nine targets came off of play action, and Lamar Jackson went 12 of 13 for 239 yards off play action in this game against the Commander's defense. Like, Hayden, I, I know that analytics has told us that you don't have to be successful running the football to throw play action, but again, my dumb brain just thinks maybe – just maybe it definitely helps when Derrick Henry is just running over your face and oh, yeah. you step up and climb and honor the play action fake to stop it. And then once again, when that happens, you constantly see Zay flowers work over top of linebackers underneath the safety, yep. just running away from the quarterback that's trying to trail him into these cavities. And that's mm -hmm. just working over and over and over again. And what I loved, and it's exactly what we talked about with the, Buffalo Bills, I believe, and what we talked about against the Dallas Cowboys, that Baltimore forced this Washington Commanders team into base personnel defense 25% of snaps. Previously, Washington, again with Dan Quinn, had been in base defense with three linebackers in the field on 1% of plays Yep, this season, yep. 1%. So again, that is dictating what you want the defense to do, going against their trends, going against how they've even built their roster because they don't have enough good players to do it. And that's how the Ravens are just demolishing yep. these guys at the, at the moment. The commanders actually changed their uh, inactive list based off of the personnel that the Ravens use. And we saw that uh, from Dan Quinn in the press conference. So really cool to see. And then one little chart for you, no surprise here, but outliers are going to outlier. Look at Derrick Henry on this chart. This is like over the last month. Everyone's kind of like near their expected points. Like that's how a good model works. And then there's the big dog way up here, ripping off chunk gains. Once they get in the red zone, uh, the Ravens have one of the highest uh, run rates inside the 10 yard line. No surprise there, but man, like this team is really firing. And then last note here, just remember the days with Greg Roman, like when they would get in the pass game, there would just be like wide receivers and tight ends, like right on top of each other in this game. You just saw Zay flowers and Rashad Bateman. You saw Mark Andrews by, by himself completely separated. And I know like that that's not like saying a whole lot, but it's like a functional pass game. And obviously Lamar Jackson is going to create, on his own as well. So really impressive team. One of the best teams in the NFL. I don't know if you cited this when you're talking about Rashad Bateman, but Matt Harmon pointed out that I think 82% of his catches this year have gone for first downs or touchdowns. Um, and he had four more, he had four more receptions that equaled first downs in this mm -hmm. past game. So even getting that guy as a role player that gave it extension to this off season. And now we can mention like Mark Andrews is a role player. Isaiah likely is a role player. Nelson Aguilar, Charlie Kolar. When you have this trio of just Lamar Jackson, Derek Henry, and Zay Flowers, and again, incorporating someone like Justice Hill, too, as a role player. Yes. I mean, just amazing, amazing offensive success and team building and incorporating the right the right guys in the right situations. And by the way, just the uh, top four scores of the running back position, Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley, Alvin Kamara, and Joe Mixon. Who the hell needs first and second year breakouts at that position anymore? That's right. We're back. Age cliff. See ya. Speaking of back, the Carolina Panthers are up next for us here. Uh, we can actually segue this into a right thing. Jonathan Brooks pra practice window opens. Uh, the best thing you can say about the Panthers is what could happen for them in the future. Uh, Dave Canales is not promising anything for Jonathan Brooks and his playing time where he's going to be activated or any of that stuff. This is the question because Chuba Hubbard, to be honest right now, Hayden is a top 16 scorer at the position. Uh, we have consistently said, and I don't want to repeat myself that we do on every single one of these shows, 
But to me, Jonathan Brooks is more of a 2025 play than 2024. Mm -hmm. But we could see him creep into at least the Miles Sanders role, if not more than that six to eight touches once we hit, I don't know, week 10, week 11, those types of things. Chiba Hubbard, the last month, which is the Andy Dalton splits, he's been the RB5 and RB4 usage. Like He's just been a total baller out there. He's had some explosive runs. They like stay committed to Chuba Hubbard for longer than other coaches would as well. So yeah, not expecting a whole lot for Jonathan Brooks in October and November. Maybe we get lucky and he starts popping off later in the season. But I, I do agree. This is a 2025 team. And I, I think Chuba Hubbard's like earned like maybe some consideration, like kind of hang on to the roster. Uh, I believe it's a contract year for him, but I wouldn't be surprised yes. if they, if the, if they just keep him around because when the Panthers have been brutal the last, what, 25 games, Chuba Hubbard has been like a consistent player uh, for them. So uh, pretty impressive stuff for, for Chuba. Again, the place where the Panthers sh- dished out so much money this offseason were Damian Lewis and Robert Hunt. And those guys have been excellent, mm-hmm. arguably the best players on this team. So, uh, yeah, the running game is all that works. The running game is all that works. Xavier League had a nice... Uh, fingertip grab touchdown but other than that again it's the only thing that works and the Panthers have a history of two running back stables let's put it that way Stephen Davis to Sean Foster if you ever even remember those days Hayden that might have been before your time and uh and you only know Deshaun Foster is UCLA's head coach and that's not going well for him yeah I know him well that's good news (laughs) and and D'Angelo Williams and and Jonathan Stewart so maybe maybe Chuba Hubbard and I know like the Panthers don't have maybe it's not the best place for them to put money into but a Dave Montgomery like contract for him. And then uh, he's not that caliber of a talent. And then Jonathan Brooks, he kind of become this running back stable for them in the future. Real quick, just with uh, Deontay Johnson, uh, he is the wide receiver 10 and wide receiver four overall usage over the last month of the season. It's not going to be pretty every single week, but I do think that Deontay Johnson is going to be one of the better draft picks uh, of, of the off season based off where he was going. Yeah. If, if we just look at from week three to, Week six, Deontay Johnson, the wide receiver 10 in yeah. points per game at this point. If you want to support us, the best way of doing that is to go play on Underdog and use promo code the show or click the link in the description down below. As I say in every single episode right now, it is Boostober. That means free things for you. Every single day around lunchtime, they're going to throw boosts and specials on Major League Baseball, on I believe the WNBA is still going on, obviously NFL stuff, college football, so on and so forth. So you can do... Battle Royale drafts every single week. If you have that draft itch, you can go and play pick them with your state allows it again. That is underdog. That is boost Tober. And the best way of doing that is to use promo code, the show and play. And once again, with Ray GQ on these rankings episodes, we've been doing a nice job on these pick them entries and we're going to be playing those. So get ready for it and go and play with us. All right, Chicago bears. It's all hitting against the defenses that it should. Hayden, they are now heading into the bye week. What have you seen recently from the Chicago team? Just a more functional offense, just in general. Caleb has looked better. We're seeing Caleb just move around better. That's something I've seen. It's design uh, rush attempts. It's definitely some scrambling ability. You're always going to get the throw on the run capabilities for Caleb Williams, but it was nice to see Keenan Allen make a couple uh, red zone grabs here. We saw the back shoulder throw uh from caleb williams put it on the money and then a back shoulder fade uh where actually like the one of the offensive linemen almost got caleb williams killed immediately but still was able to get that thing off i just think that the offense looks at least watchable there's still some frustrations on the offensive line but there's just too many throws where caleb williams like just could put it on the money with tons of velocity and there's a lot more movement to his game so this ground game's working everything's kind of tying into uh uh, together a little bit um, easier than what we saw like in weeks one and week two. And to be honest, again, the weeks one through three stuff. So we got the Titans, the Texans and the Colts on paper. The Texans defense is a legit good one, right? Yes. The other two are league average at best, but then we know the Rams, the Panthers and the Jaguars defenses are among the league worst. Yes. Uh, after the buy, they get the Washington commanders and the Arizona Cardinals which you can also kind of group in this later bucket too. What a nice five game stretch for them also to get Mm -hmm. the play calling right at the exact same time, the personnel usage stuff, right at the Mm -hmm. exact same time. I would love to see Romo Dunze play in two wide receiver sets consistently over Keenan Allen. That's another conversation. I don't want to completely jump on Shane Waldron for every single one of his choices. But to me, like the one frontier that Caleb Williams can still improve on 
is that he's still completing just 26% of his throws, 20 plus yards or more down the field. Like statistically, he's either worst or second worst or third worst on downfield passes. We know he has the arm for it. We see these, like the way the ball gets there so quickly, it's pretty amazing. It's mm-hmm. not all just on him, but in the second half, the post by rookie bump for the quarterback, if we get even more downfield passing that is successful from Caleb Williams, then yep. we're off to the freaking races. Yeah, that interception he had just like had the wrong club. So that's something they just yep. has to work on. Uh, sometimes it's too much of a line drive. Sometimes the ball kind of just hangs in the air. But those were not issues at, at USC. So I do think that will get created. And then there's like one play design, which I've seen from uh, the 49ers at times. You have like pump fake left, pump fake right. And then Cole Komet leaks out over the middle of the field. That's how he scored uh, that one touchdown. Saw a little bit more motion, maybe. I'm not sure if the, the numbers back me up, but just watching this game, a little bit more creativity. And we're getting the right guys on the field with Cole Komet playing over Gerald Everett. So I think there's like lots of reasons to be excited for the Chicago Bears. This defense is also still really dang good. So I think this team's very much in the wild card race. The defense is really outstanding, and that allows you to be in all these games. Again, they won one earlier in the year where the quarterback played like garbage, and yep. it's because of the special teams and the uh, and and the defense. Um, and this screen game is, I think, one of the best in the league, mm-hmm. and something to watch. Caleb's a major force in that too, so uh, definitely, definitely something to watch moving forward. Go ahead. What about with DJ Moore? So. Uh, DJ Moore and Roma Dunze, both season low in usage. Obviously, Keenan Allen scores the two touchdowns, but those were like kind of first read looks to to Keenan Allen down there. It's, uh, like temperature check on these two players. Uh, I, I, it's like a little bit hard to kind of figure out. Like Caleb Williams has to be a total baller for all three of those guys, plus Cole Komet, plus DeAndre Swift in the screen game to to be there. Like, Are, are we just going to be like kind of in the inconsistent range for DJ Moore? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a lot of guys, right? Rarely do we have a rookie quarterback with a play caller we don't truly believe in still, sorry, Shane, uh, that has to dish it out to all of these players. The bonus, once again, is who they've played in the last three weeks and then who they play in the next two games once they come off this bye week. I don't know how you look at your roster, Hayden, and you say, I'm going to bench DJ Moore against the Washington Commanders and the Arizona Cardinals. No, you know, so you just have to like, you just have to suck up the inconsistency that it might bring you. Yeah, I think same thing with Roma Dunes. I think Roma Dunes is probably still more of a bench play than must must yeah. play until we kind of see him in two wide receiver sets or in, until he kind of separates uh, from Keenan Allen. I am still optimistic about Rome. I understand that good. we're seeing all of these rookie wide receivers go off, right? You can throw, and we'll talk about him, Ladd and Brian Thomas we've talked about in the past, and there are a few others. But leave the light on everyone out there. Leave the light on for Roma Dunes. Mm-hmm. This is when it starts to pick up maybe a little bit more. Cincinnati Bengals, Hayden, we're, we're thrilled that you're back. Um, but I think we might have to welcome you to the Zach Moss funeral. Do you see that that way? So he he fumbles in the third quarter and doesn't get a touch. He was uh, only playing on third and long situations down the stretch. And this was a close game. And Chase Brown got all of the early down touches. Now, the Bengals did go on a little bit of a ride there with Chase Brown down the stretch. There was one play where he bounced it outside for like a negative five-yard loss. Uh, Chase Brown also fumbled after Zach Moss fumbled. The difference was Chase Brown's fumbled went out of bounds. So uh, he got lucky there, but obviously that touchdown run from Chase Brown up the middle, his speed is being showcased. So uh, we'll see if that was a one week uh, sample or one quarter sample where Chase Brown kind of separates, but Zach Moss, you can't be the slower running back and fumble the ball, but it was notable that he was at least in pass protection out there. So uh, we'll see if, if Chase Brown goes out there and completely takes over the early down usage, then yes, this was the, the Zach Moss funeral. You can't fumble the ball if you're not the fastest running back on your team. Yeah, I always revert back to Joe Goodberry and all things Bengals. And he's had some really poignant comments towards Chase Brown. Quote, this is good news. Chase Brown being limited with the quad injury yesterday got me nervous. He is the reason This offense has gotten to elite levels this year. I mean, that is not mincing words. The reason that the Bengals offense has gotten to elite levels is because of Chase Brown. And if I can put myself in Joe's brain, a magical place. All right. Dad of the year every single year. It's because they're having an explosive passing game with Jamar Chase. They have a chain mover, a red zone threat, NT Higgins, right? But if it's just Zach Moss out there to like pick up, little plays here or there versus, you know, the Zach Moss that we got last year that was explosive runs. Adding the explosive element 
adding the guy who can score that 30 yard touchdown at the end of games. To me, that means that they can live with some of those bad runs that Chase Brown is still going to give you the mm -hmm. negative one when you should get six yards or the negative five when you should get a gain of two because this league now is so much about explosive plays and big gains and game changing moments. And Chase Brown is just more likely to get those. Plus Hayden, it's kind of reverted to what we saw in the preseason a little bit, the trust, the auditions that Chase Brown has gotten. He had 20 passing down snaps this past week compared to just 16 for Zach Moss and every other game, Zach Moss was around 25 to 32 of those. So a lot of those didn't end in pass pro reps for Brown. But still, if he's already taking away the passing down stuff, then Zach Moss is much more trending closer to that 40% work than mm -hmm. the 60% work that we saw earlier in the year. Yeah, that, that's how I would kind of handicap this thing moving forward. So, yeah, Chase Brown has been like earning a couple more reps here and there. We saw it at the goal line where it's like not the like more traditional goal line stuff, but they're throwing like quick little out routes in the flats to Chase Brown. So they're getting creative with him. And yeah, he's just he's just a very explosive player. And the, I think the offensive line for the Cincinnati Bengals has been looking pretty solid throughout. So um, just wanted to note that the Chase Brown fumble did not uh, did not stay in play, it did go out of bounds. So he did get kind of lucky with that. Now, Zach Moss still just on the season has 10 carries inside of the 10 yard line compared to Chase Brown's two. So we'll see if that changes more and more and more as we go along. Obviously, Chase Brown has scored some red zone touchdowns as a receiver on mm -hmm. top of that. Dallas Cowboys, they are spiraling. The schedule only gets more difficult. They are headed into a bye week. Hayden, is there any possibility to right this ship after the bye week facing off against the San Francisco 49ers, then the Atlanta Falcons, then the Philadelphia Eagles, and then the Houston Texans? Oh, geez. I mean... Really, like they have offensive line issues with two rookies, so maybe there's a post is a post by rookie bump for offensive linemen. That's got to exist, right? I haven't looked into that, but hopefully that gets better. But Dak Prescott's just like been throwing too many uh, like turnover worthy throws this year, so that's been the difference. CD Lamb's not getting the the usage that we saw last year when he was like clearly the number one in expected points every week this last month cd lamb's a wide receiver 16 i think part of that's because they don't have a secondary uh wide receiver to kind of take away some of those double coverage looks that we've seen cd lamb get so maybe jalen tolbert starts step stepping up maybe this turpin kid um starts stepping up but it is looking pretty bleak out there um for the dallas cowboys i, I mentioned dak prescott on the drop list with sam sherman yesterday that was a, a line that you just snuck in there that I don't know if any of the comments picked up on, but I understand it. Like how Dallas has been in recent years, Dak Prescott obviously has not played flawless football, but for stretches of the season, like last year, if you look beyond week five and towards the end of the year, he was what a top five scoring quarterback because mm -hmm. it was razor sharp lasers. So much is on his plate. And then now again, it's a thin margin. And if that's not connecting and if other pieces get worse around him, it's just going to turn into this again, this team was built with all starters and no depth. And even if some of their starters go down or aren't playing to their capabilities, and that especially goes to Dak Prescott and then CD lamb too, then it, the house of cards just kind of falls. And mm -hmm. that's where we're at now. I don't think the Rico Dattle thing from a usage standpoint is going away just in terms of how much volume is getting. That's not going to ever turn into, in my opinion, a consistent top 12 scoring running back. Just again, the dysfunction of this offense, but the very least after this bye week I know it's tough competition, but once we get into other bye weeks that at least gives you some flex viability and value. Yeah. No more deuce Vaughn, uh, a little bit less of the fullback as well so rico dowdle zeke are kind of rotating um some drives early in the game but rico dowdle does finish with more opportunities and we did see the coaching staff mention rico dowdle as a candidate to get more usage down the stretch so yeah i think they might retire zeke elliott after the bye week here rico dowdle the last month has been the running back 21 on running back 28 usage i think that's kind of like the starting point i hope hopefully the cowboys look a little bit more functional uh, on both sides of the ball, their defense has been terrible. Um, they're not like even trying to tackle at this point anymore. So Rico Dowdle needs the defense to play a little bit better, get off the field, and then Dak Prescott on the offensive line has to play better for Rico Dowdle to be a trusted RB2. I think the path is there, but I'm not sure if it's like the expectation. And on top of all that that we mentioned, the Dallas Cowboys are also 30th in red zone touchdown success rate at 37.5%, only ahead of the Miami Dolphins and the New England Patriots. That's it. Yeah. 
And they're turning the ball over down there, too. Not a good combination. <laughs> That's real bad. Can it get worse? Yes, it can. All right. Denver Broncos up next. I really don't have that much to say about this team. I don't have much to say. The All the Bo Nick stuff was in the second half. I mean, he had 22 right. yards at halftime. He is an awesome scrambler. And what that actually gives us is a useful fantasy player, especially in super flex leagues, because Bo Nix has eyes in the back of his head and mm -hmm. still doesn't get sacked as much as he should and other quarterbacks do. But Hayden, in a weird way, and you might hate this comparison, he's giving us fancy points in a somewhat similar fashion. At least it feels in the way that like Sam Howell was giving us fancy points last year. Yeah, I, I think that's that's not too far off here. He at least has Cortland Sutton to kind of bail him out. That touchdown grab that he had was one of the best catches you'll see over the course of the season. Cortland Sutton, for fantasy purposes, this month, wide receiver 34 on wide receiver 15 usage. Like That's going to be the, the the style play for Cortland Sutton, but they're trying with the rest of these wide receivers. Vele returns. He fills in for Josh Reynolds. You get Troy Franklin in the mix a little bit um still no marvin mims so that's not going to happen and then the other note i had from this game javante williams does fumble audric estimate returns uh from injured reserve so we'll see if they end up making a, a running back change down the stretch but to me you could throw javante williams into your flex play during bye weeks i think that Cortland sudden is a wide receiver three um maybe a wide receiver four but aside from that really no interest um for the broncos detroit lions uh, I love that we have always loved David Montgomery because yes. Dan Campbell loves him some David Montgomery. Did you see the line where he said, I wish I had played with someone like David Montgomery, Ooh. which is, you know, the ultimate compliment. He can probably play, pay any player in the league. Mm -hmm. um, so this team is so balanced now and they weren't to open the year, but they are now where we know how successful. And as we spoke about earlier in the show, the running back usage split that in half. It's still, you know, a lead back on one of 10 or 12 offenses across the league. So we know about that, Dave Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs. But on top of it, 30% of their passing plays this past game went for 15 or more yards. So you get the rushing success, and then you also get the explosive plays down the field. What more can you ask for? Yeah, we saw Ben Johnson go deep into his trick playbook in this one. They were basically trolling the Dallas Cowboys. Yes. It, it, it was on my radar that... Jerry Jones uh, might have a head coach opening. Ben Johnson wants $25 million per year, and he empties the clip on all these trick plays. Sam Laporta is the beneficiary of a, a touchdown off some trickeration, but they kept going back uh, to that well. So I thought that was interesting. And then, yeah, Jamison Williams scores a, a, a long touchdown here. Tom Brady, yes, that Tom Brady mentioned that on that play, the, the Lions use all this pre-snap motion. They... Uh, have a lot of personnel uh, looks they use a lot of formations in general and but on that play they use tempo quick snap catch Trayvon Diggs sleeping for a, a long play for Jameson Williams so it was just like a master class for for Ben Johnson here um but they are so balanced that it's like a little bit more unpredictable on who's going to be the one to kind of score like a Monroe St. Brown's usage is down Sam Laporte's usage is down and then we kind of gloss over this but like Jameer Gibbs usage is way down like this last month yeah. He's a running back 19 uh, in expected points. David Montgomery is a running back 12. So it has been more of a flippening this year with Montgomery as the lead back. Gibbs is the one like kind of like looking for the secondary stuff, but so many weapons. And if, if uh, with Aiden Hutchinson out for so long, maybe they get some shootouts where, you know, the other team could score some points. Yeah. I actually wanted to bring up the Aiden Hutchinson thing because rarely do defensive injuries to me matter as much as this one. Okay. Yes. He owned 55% of his team's pressures, which the next closest in the league was Nick Bosa at 42%. I mean, Aiden Hutchinson was this team's get off the field player. And now they don't have one. Brian Branch is awesome. And he baited, you know, Dak Prescott into some awesome interceptions, but this team's run defense has been great. And Aiden Hutchinson is a major part of that. So if that mm -hmm. suffers, then that's already, you know, one leg off the table. Maybe that gets kicked out from underneath it. Then two, the pass defense is not good. It is not good, despite what the Cowboys did last week. And the only way it could get off the field was Aiden Hutchinson with his motor, with his athleticism, sacking, pressuring the quarterback. And with that now, it, it, it worries me just as a team success level as a whole of right. what this team could achieve this season. 
Yeah, it's it's a huge impact. ESPN analytics have uh, Aiden Hutchinson as the highest pressure rate in the NFL. It's not even really close either. So yeah, huge huge news for for the the Lions. They need like Terry and Arnold first round corner to play better. Uh, Carlton Davis, they got him this offseason. Another corner he needs to play a little bit better. Uh, in the meantime, Brian Branch keeps bailing him out. I mean, what a player! Uh, like. Per, per pound player in the league, like Brian Branch, very high up on that list. So we'll we'll see. It's such a good coaching staff that you want to believe that the secondary, lots of new uh, pieces kind of glues together as the season rolls on. But uh, now they're going to do it with less pass rush. So it might be asking for too much. We'll keep it moving. Green Bay Packers. Uh, the Dontavian Wicks run out could not have been worse. Brutal. Uh, I mean, it really was. <laughs> when he got his opportunity and it popped up, he dropped it literally. Yeah. And then now he's out multiple weeks or week to week, I should say with a shoulder issue. And then the guys who did return when they were absent in Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson are the ones that make the big plays are the ones that scored the touchdowns. Mm. That's just fancy football, isn't it? Yeah, it really is a tough run out there, but zooming out, like the reason why you wanted to be in on Wicks is because this offense could really get the ball rolling through the air downfield. And Wicks can be a part of that if he does return. But yeah, I mean, Christian Watson wide open uh, on his deep target for a touchdown. Romeo Dobbs uh, gets in the mix. It was nice to see the Packers organization kind of like work through the Romeo Dobbs stuff, like a, a lesser organization, like completely punts off Romeo Dobbs. And like when you need Romeo Dobbs to step up, he was able to step up there. My concern here, and I'm not sure if it's anything his fault. I think that Josh Jacobs looks good on tape. It would, I will say, it would be nice if Josh Jacobs scored a couple more touchdowns <laughs> this season. You know, like all the production is just going to go through the air and he's just not going to score yep. any touchdowns this year. I mean, what the hell yep. is going on? Hopefully that evens out over the course of, of the year. But Packers, another explosive uh, showing on offense. Josh Jacobs right now, uh, this will make you even more irritated has nine carries inside of the 10 yard line. That's probably if I'm estimating right now about 13th or 14th in the NFL. So it's not like he's getting zero of these opportunities and Hayden, he owns 90% of the team's carries inside the 10, a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the team's carries inside of the five yard line, which only equals five, but still they just don't need to run the football. In those situations, they just what? don't need to do it. They throw the football instead. And it's not even inside the red zone. They don't even have to get to the red zone. That's, that's going to be my point. It's like, how many touchdowns do they have beyond the the the, the red zones? Like, that's like the issue for, for I'm, I'm looking at, uh, yeah, they, they pass the ball a little bit more than average inside the 10-yard line, but nothing too crazy. There will be bigger Josh Jacobs games. I, I can promise you that. Houston Texans, speaking of big games, Joe Mixon this year, basically two games played. Two incredible yeah. fantasy performances. We kind of thought that this was possible, you know, where he goes from the Cincinnati Bengals, where last year his efficiency, at least inside the red zone, was abysmal. It's because the shotgun runs allowing instant disruption. He couldn't get going at all and was tackled in the backfield. And he just looked like an inefficient runner. Mm -hmm. But now in this Houston Texans offense, a lot more under center stuff, a lot more of these edge runs. And he just looks... Super, super explosive. Again, he's a mm -hmm. top four scorer, albeit it's basically only two performances this year, but a top four scorer at the position. And I don't know how that's really going to slow down. I mean, especially the Texans defense is really good. They're two edge rushers completely dominated the last game. So he's going to be have favorable game scripts. He's being utilized in the past game a little bit as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, everything's rolling with Joe Mixon. It's like him, like coming off that ankle injury and looking the part, there's like so many running backs that come back from that ankle injury. And you're just like, yeah, the, the rest of the season's just not, not going to look the same. Joe Mixon cleared that on tape. So that was really promising. And then uh, tank Dell, no surprise here, season high in expected points about 15 of them in the first game without Nico Collins. When you kind of uh, chop off 30% of those targets, a lot of those air yards, uh, tank Dell is going to start popping off here. So with Nico out for the next four, four weeks, this is where those round three, round four tank Dell bags start to look a little bit cleaner um, because the Texans, uh, they're just one of the best teams in the league. Last week without Nico Collins, they ran 12 personnel. So two tight end sets on 45% of the time, uh, with Nico Collins, I believe that was down to about 31%. That makes so sense. it's only a shift of about 12 to 13, which might seem small, 
But I want to point out that 11 of those 30 plays in 12 personnel were actually in the first quarter. It wasn't because that this was a blowout against the New England Patriots and they split it down the middle. It was 15 runs and 15 passes. So people, you know, started moving in the direction of Xavier Hutchinson and some of these other guys uh, just because they were running more and more three wide receiver sets this year. I don't know if that's the case. I think now they're going to be flexible like they were with their personal mm-hmm. group. Who's Nico Collins mm-hmm. last year, not just more so live out of three wide receiver sets after adding Stefan Diggs this year with Nico Collins out. Does that make sense to you? That that definitely does. Indianapolis Colts. I think we can say this. It's week seven. It's a certainty. Josh Downs is the most important wide receiver on the Indianapolis Colts roster. The way, and we loved him coming out of North Carolina, the way he like finds space, catches it, still gets up the field, creates on his own. It's a really cool slot receiver that you don't see a lot throughout the league. And he perfectly fits with Shane Sykin. The question that I'm now getting Hayden, if he fits as well with Anthony Richardson as he does with Joe Flacco, because where he's at right now, he basically averages the same amount of points on a weekly basis as Mike Evans, Debo Samuel and Brian Thomas jr. Uh, The people are nervous that with AR, it's going to get much, much, much worse. I think it will get much worse though, over the last four weeks, which includes the, the Flacco games. They've been top 10 in wide receiver usage. Um, but I don't think that's going to kind of hold up throughout the entire season. With, with Josh Downs, just the player, to me, like part of his success is just Shane Steichen using him in the perfect ways. Like his touchdown, he gets lined up against a linebacker out and up creates some separation, tracks the ball well, that's a touchdown. There were some whip routes underneath. You see him in the the screen game. You see him behind the line of scrimmage at times, and he can sit down in zone coverage, but he has enough speed where if if it is a man coverage in the slot, he can win those matchups. There's still some areas where he kind of has some weaknesses, like he had a fumble near the first down marker, but in general, he's the manufactured touch player. He moves really well on tape, and Shane Steichen's going to, uh, move around him. And if there are like slow linebackers, slow safeties, uh, I think that Josh Downs is going to be kind of the center point there. So yeah, the question is, I think it's just gonna be so hard with Pittman still around and downs. Alec Pierce has been uh, playing well this season. Once you have Richardson back, I do think it's going to be way more complicated uh, for Josh Downs to get there, but he is a good player. And I do agree that he is the, the best wide receiver on the team. Maybe I'm just being devil's advocate here. I don't think it's going to be as bad as people believe. Anthony Richardson's had a player like this in his past, albeit he forces him a bit more further down the field, which we've seen Josh Downs actually do with Anthony Richardson in the past. He can do it uh, with Ricky Pearsall. And now the same steady production floor that you get with Josh Downs on a weekly basis might not be there as often because of inaccuracies and also attacking more blades of grass with Anthony Richardson. But at the same time, it's what you said. A lot of the Josh Downs production is manufactured stuff in a good way, right? Full speed motion across the field. Boom. Here he is in open space. Oh, we're uh, leveraging him in this open area of the field. Let him sit in it. Boom. Attack that. We saw that more. I felt consistently accurately timing wise last year with Anthony Richardson in the small sample they played together versus this year with him, with Anthony Richardson. Again, we're just working in really small samples with Josh Downs, Anthony Richardson playing Mm -hmm. together and, Once again, maybe I'm just an apologist here, but I think that these two talented players are going to be able to figure it out versus the sky is falling stuff that I see on Twitter from a lot of people. Well, you're not going to like this. I'm just going to share my screen. This is Ricky Pearsall in with (laughs) Anthony Richardson. He had 33 catches in 13 games. And then after Richardson leaves, he has 65. So like, I think there's going to be some up and down performances, but at least he's a good player and at least Shane Steichen's a good coach. Um, and at least the, the Colts defense is really bad. So if Anthony Richardson can play better, um, we do have a, a ceiling to chase. So I'm, I'm probably in the middle of everybody on the, that take. Okay. Speaking of the sky is falling. That brings us to the Jacksonville Jaguars because me, we have been propping up. Tank Bigsby as one of the most explosive rushers in the league. And if something ever happened to Travis Etienne, which we are not wishing upon anyone, then Tank Bigsby would get his workload and get a really nice role. Well, Travis Etienne is now week to week with an upper body injury. And then what we got was Dearness Johnson dominating the second half snaps. Uh, I want people to remove themselves from the keyboard. 
a little bit and try to look at some nuance and perspective of why this might have happened of Dearness Johnson dominating the snaps. It's because the Jacksonville Jaguars were down 18 points in the third quarter at the start of the third quarter with a 0% chance of winning this <laughs> Zero. game. Zero. Okay, 0%. And Tank Bigsby, I understand if you look back at his days at Auburn, he might have had a nice passing down profile. Okay. What he put out on tape with five or seven targets during his rookie year was the worst passing down portfolio you yes. will ever see for an NFL player. So all that Doug Peterson knows about Tank Bixby is that he's bad in mm -hmm. pass protection and that he's bad on passing downs. And so that's why Travis Etienne had still held on to the passing down work. And it's why Jarenis Johnson dominated these snaps. All we need is for the Jacksonville Jaguars, and this might be a difficult challenge, is for them to not be down 18 points at any point in the game. And if that's the case, zero, seven, 10, positive or negatively, yeah. hopefully that means St. Bigsby is going to get these rushing snaps. And if he does, if he gets the 15 or 18 or 20 of them, he'll probably roll off a big play mm -hmm. and be really nice for a fantasy asset. I think you slap him like running back 22 uh, going into the week and you kind of adjust it from there. He's been really good this year on the ground, super explosive runner. Um, yeah, he's not trusted in, pa in passing situations, but that's okay. So yeah, we, ha we had the same exact notes, like literally a 0% probability to win the game <laughs> yeah. when Dearness Johnson was getting the ball. Like, yes, there's a little bit of context here. And that's why we show these, char these charts every single week uh, for the running back usage, because so much of the snap rates and stuff is just like based off of the context of, of how the game is flowing. For example, Last week, Darius Johnson had 25 passing down plays, passing down snaps. Tank Bixby has 27 passing down snaps all season long. So right. they just don't trust him mm -hmm. in that way. Maybe you can earn some of that as we go along here. Uh, but he has no choice other than in neutral games and to open yeah. games for Tank Bixby to be the starting running back for this team right now. And like just moving forward, Travis Etienne, contract year. Jacksonville's team looks terrible. We don't know if the coaching staff, the GM is going to be around. Like, is there just a chance that they used to tank Bigsby even when Travis Etienne returns? I'm not sure if Etienne's like so, so good that he has to be back on the field. Like, there's a chance that just tank Bigsby runs away with the early down role. And then Travis Etienne kind of inherits the Dearness Johnson stuff. So I think there's a lot of reason to be uh, optimistic with, with tank Bigsby. Right. And this week, it's the New England Patriots. That should not be a game. Yeah. That should not be a game where they're trailing by 18 points. If they are something is seriously wrong. And Doug Peterson is literally not gone. coming back from England. Yes. You yes. know, just gonzo. So a neutral game script with tank Bigsby should be good stuff for us. Famous last words yes. for me. And you. Um, did want to point out there was one rep and I think it's kind of encapsulates like exactly what's going wrong with Trevor Lawrence in the past game. They have Brian Thomas come in motion. We like that. Brian Thomas using his speed. He's going to be running like a, basically a wheel route, go route, uh, in a positive matchup. It's coming off a of play action under center, like all that type of stuff. But they asked Trevor Lawrence to kind of like do like this, like bootleg back to the other way and then set his feet and have to throw the ball 55 yards in the air to Brian Thomas. That's just like asking Trevor Lawrence to do way too much. There's like way too many reps where things just look super difficult. We saw this last year, all those stats we talked about near catches in the end zone, always next to the sideline contested catch situations. Well, part of the problem is because there's asking their players to make too difficult of plays. Like that rep would be a perfect opportunity where yes, like maybe the bootleg look is going to help in, in some situations, but when you're going to be designing a play to Brian Thomas that far down the field, can we just do a regular play action and, and set that thing up? So Brian Thomas had his drops. Gabe Davis had a couple drops. Trevor Lawrence missed some throws once again, but I thought like that play was just like a, a rep where everything just looks so difficult for Jacksonville almost every single week. Evan Ingram returns and immediately scores massive points for the tight end mm -hmm. position. I mean, 13.2, uh, I would take off my pinky toe for that at some points <laughs> this year, you know? Uh, I think that's legit because what we've talked about is in previous years, this team having a ceiling on top of them, but being quite good in the zero to let's say 16 yard range, right? That was Christian Kirk. And that was Evan Ingram in previous years this year when Evan Ingram missed basically weeks one through weeks five, they were very good at throwing down the field, namely to Brian Thomas, but having zero ability to do the easy button stuff underneath. 
I think as soon as Evan Ingram comes back, Hayden, this team oh boy. for better or for worse is kind of just going to spam him much more often than they have in the past. And also we're getting way too much Gabe Davis inside way the much. red zone and inside the end zone. He is among the league leaders in end zone targets, right? Yeah. And how, how many of those have, has he been catching? Not, not too many of them, man. It's, it's a frustrating watch over there. And so I, I guess we'll learn was the Evan Ingram stuff because there was a 0% chance of winning the ball game, or was that something stickier? Also want to note, I do think that Christian Kirk could be a trade candidate if they lose another game here. Um, everyone must go if they lose to the Patriots next week. Kansas City Chiefs, uh, they are coming out of their bye week. Typically, I asked, what do you want to see moving forward in this situation? Mm-hmm. I actually want us to spend a little bit more time on this situation because right. to me, it's vital. It's really a vital situation for the rest of the fantasy football season. These are, I'm not going to say unserious names, but they're old names that we should not have to think about as massive fantasy assets in 2024. And I'm talking about Juju Smith-Schuster and Kareem Hunt. But Hayden, the way they are being utilized in this offense makes me want to lock in Juju Smith-Schuster as a Mm -hmm. wide receiver two slash wide receiver three and Kareem Hunt as a running back two despite them both being declining talents since the last five to six years, am I off base on that and only relying on usage and role over talent at this point? But it's it's usage and role attached to the like league leader in uh, success rate attached to Patrick Mahomes. So I think that there's some ways to overcome uh, some of these issues. So with Juju, I think that he was running a lot of the routes that Rasheed Rice was Uh, running we saw some rpo slant stuff we saw a little bit of broken play potential remember that they have chemistry together so this isn't like signed off the street there's some chemistry between juju and patrick mahomes um kareem hunt basically calling isaiah pacheco like that's the impression that we're going to get especially because carson Steele keeps fumbling the ball there travis kelsey season high 15.2 expected points in the one game without rasheed rice i think that's going to be the standard of the offense um I think like if you're asking like what what am I looking for in this offense post by rookie bump Xavier Worthy on like a per target uh look at things through metrics which is like the best way to do it he's one of the most efficient players out there he just has not getting enough targets is there a way to get him the ball a little bit more right. are we gonna see Mahomes like actually pull the trigger on these deep post routes give Xavier Worthy a chance does he have a little bit more to him than this uh, either behind the line of scrimmage stuff? or 40 yards down the field type of stuff. That to me is going to be the question and they really need him to turn into more than that, or they're gonna have to make a move at the deadline. So I'm sure that there are some fancy shows out there bringing up that post by Ricky bump, things of the sort. Why can't we just get Xavier worthy in some of the Rishi rice mill, the field stuff again, maybe I'm a simple brain type of person. Xavier Worthy's body just does not fit that styling in this Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes passing game. Like it's choice routes, it's option routes, it's sitting in zone and it's winning after the catch with like a big, tough body in that area of the field. I'm a fan of Xavier Worthy. I think he can actually do legit wide receiver stuff and run legit routes. I just don't see how he gets more than one or two extra targets in that area of the field and take on like a massive portion of the pie that Rasheed Rice is left behind. I would say like if going back to this off season, we know what Xavier Worthy was going to provide from his college profile. And I told you Rasheed Rice and Hollywood Brown are gone and it's a post by rookie bump. You and I would be throwing an absolute party for I Xavier Worthy. So I, I think like, yeah, your explanation might be like the most likely scenario, but in 40% of the times we run the simulation, there's a chance that Xavier Worthy really takes off in similar ways to where she rise down the stretch last year, where they're kind of gearing him up. And by the end of the season, he was absolutely dominating. So I would like to see these next couple of weeks. I mean, so maybe like the player I'm looking forward to watching the most, the next couple of weeks is Xavier worthy just wow. because the chiefs like desperately need him. Um, just a f- more explosiveness. Like they're successful. Their offensive line is good, but man, like they need like some explosive passes. And I think that he's the only answer. Cause we know that Juju Smith Schuster is not going to be that. But I do feel like on some level, this team is just okay doing what they've been doing, you know, like these little singles and maybe a double here or there. And that's all that they feel like they need because Patrick Mahomes is 
playing that good of football. I mean, they're not even good in the red zone. It's unreal. They're 29th in the league in red zone touchdown success rate at 39%. That is unreal to have that number while also being one of the best teams in the league attached to it. Just quickly, if we get one easier catch for Xavier Worthy per game and a locked in two deep targets to Xavier Worthy per game, no matter what, I'll be a happy man on top of what we've seen so far. Like that's yeah. all I would want on top of it. And I'm not asking for too much with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if he flops and can't provide more than that, Christian Kirk, DeAndre Hopkins, like there's some other guys out there that the Chiefs should at least consider. Los Angeles Chargers. J.K. Dobbins looks really good. He, he like, does, still man. looks really good. And I know he had a bye week and it's early in the season, but in every single fantasy show, it's okay when something happens to J.K. Dobbins. What if just nothing happens to J.K. <laughs> Dobbins? You know, yeah. because what J.K. Dobbins is doing right now, and I know early season we got explosive plays and we haven't gotten that many in these last few weeks, but how he had this lack of wasted movement and was putting one foot in the dirt overflow of a defensive pressure and and upfield disruption and then cutting back off it and finding a lane on like a third and two and a fourth and one to score yep. these touchdowns or create first downs. I mean, that's why they give him 25 carries in a game because mm -hmm. he's just the best running back they have point blank period. He's he's been so physical. He's been so explosive. I, I didn't like the last couple of games have been just as bullish for J.K. Dobbins as like the first couple of games when we when he proved that he was actually healthy, like last week, season high in usage, 18.1 expected points. That's with Gus Edwards on injured reserve and Kamani Vidal mixes in more on like passing situations. Kamani Vidal, let's be honest, he gets lucky that wheel route touchdown. Uh, this first touch of his career goes for a touchdown, but that's like not sustainable stuff. Um, so, yeah, I'm with you, J.K. Dobbins. He's the the running back 10 in usage over the last four weeks. And that's when the Chargers offense was looking really bad because of all those offensive line issues. That's still kind of a problem. Chargers offensive line is a little bit overrated because they're dealing with so many injuries right now. But Dobbins like getting like the bell cow usage that we did not see in the first couple of weeks when Gus Edwards had this thing in a 50-50 split. Kamani Vidal is right. not going to have that. I think Kamani Vidal is a fun handcuff uh, because I do think he can do like a Blake Corum impression for Harbaugh. But you are right. J.K. Dobbins is way too sweet right now to be taken off the field. Uh, Vidal has not proven himself yet. And kind of what we talked about with the Chicago Bears, for example, based on who they played and how they performed. The first two games of the season where J.K. Dobbins went off, the Las Vegas Raiders and the Carolina Panthers. Easy stuff, right? Mm -hmm. These last three weeks, and let's also include a Justin Herbert injury and namely the offensive line injuries. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Kansas City Chiefs, and the Denver Broncos. Three really strong defenses, okay? This week, he gets the Arizona Cardinals. There we go. <laughs> like full steam ahead. Let's go. Mm -hmm. You know, now Kamani Vidal at the very least is playing the running back two role with Gus Edwards out in a perfect world where JK Dobbins is healthy for the next three games. What do you think is the max touch workload that we could get out of Kamani Vidal or does it even Nothing. matter? And this is, and this is the only play that truly does matter towards the end. If, if he does take on the full workload due to injuries to anyone else, he's a handcuff only. Like it, it, you're not playing Kamani Vidal all right now. Like even, even if you like him, your best ball uh, week 17 is the only thing that matters. And you're happy that Kamani Vidal is on the field scoring touchdowns. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit rich. He's, he's a deep league only type of play in my, in my opinion right now. Uh, did have this note though. Uh, just chargers, just Greg Roman in general, like looking at neutral pass rate, no surprise chargers uh, bottom four, in neutral pass rate, but inside the 10 yard line, they're actually number two in uh, wow. their pass rate. What the hell is going on? Like, could we just like get that to flip? I'm sorry. I'm sure that's like a small sample size, but that was like weird to see the chargers inside the 10 yard line, pass the ball a little bit more than run it. So hopefully that means more JK Dobbins stuff. Once that kind of settles out over the next couple weeks, Vlad McConkey looks great. Yes. Okay. Looks very good. LA Rams. Uh, they are coming out of the bye week Cooper cup. Sean McVay's hinting at we could see him return in week seven. What do you want to see from them? I would like to see Cooper Cup. <laughs> I, I don't really want to see <laughs> anything else, man. I mean, Cooper Cup has a chance to like immediately go back and be the week one, week two guy where he's seeing uh like is on pace to see like 15 targets per game. So I think like that's 
the potential for Cooper Cup. He also could have a setback with his ankle immediately, and we're back to where we were last season. Like probably the most boom bust player for the rest of the season, Cooper Cup for fantasy purposes. He can be the wide receiver three, or he can be back on injured reserve before you know it. So that's what I would like to see. There was one other small little note. Kyron Williams, he had a season low in expected points in week five before the bye week because Blake Corum got in there a little bit. Now is still 16 expected points. He's still the running back one in expected points over the last month of the season. So nothing to panic uh, about with Kyron Williams, but Blake Corum, like a must pick up today. Like don't wait for Kyron Williams to get injured. Don't wait for some weirdness to pop up with Blake Corum. This next game coming off of the bye week. Now is the time to pick up Blake Corum. Make sure he's on all your rosters. He's better than the wide receiver five or the tight end two that you have. Blake Corum has like a chance to like win you your league um, if the Rams offense can kind of click uh, once they get their wide receivers back. You might have said this, but isn't that kind of comparable to the backfield, though, that we just talked about where when healthy, Kyron Williams gets all the work that J.K. Dobbins does and even more mm -hmm. so. I mean, they run the heck out of the football when they get to the yep. red zone, so it's even more elevated. And then Corum is kind of, on a slightly higher uptick than mm -hmm. the Badal path of this. But the yes. backfield matters so much that if Blake Corum somehow emerges as the lead ball carrier for this mm -hmm. team and he has already surpassed Ronnie Rivers on it, then he's a legit league winner. Yeah, definitely. Like players like Gabe Davis and stuff, like those are your bench wide receivers. Drop Keon those Coleman. To your, yeah, drop Keon Coleman for, for Blake Corum. Like no questions asked. Same with like Isaiah Likely or Blake Corum. Who's more likely to win you your league? It's the, like the Blake Corum tier. My only thing I'm noting is with Cooper Cup coming back, what does that mean for one of these secondary wide receivers? Uh, does that mean we are going to lose Jordan Whittington or does that mean we're going to lose Tutu Atwell? Because they operate in very different areas of this offense and it kind of depends on which one Sean McVay wants to rely on. And maybe that means we'll see 50% of each one because Jordan Whittington was kind of doing the isolated motion inside breaking route intermediate stuff and short and then tutu atwell is doing full speed motion right big big inside or outside or vertical breaking routes and you have to kind of manufacture his leverage and and release off the line of scrimmage to make him worthwhile out of stacks out of alignments all that type of stuff so i, I am intrigued to see which one sean mcveigh wants to prioritize over those two I'm going to pick Whittington as my guess, just because he's more physical than Tutu Atwell and the Cooper cup, like first read targets and like all the choice routes. I think that will go to, to cup and you don't need Tutu Atwell, the motion stuff nearly as much when you have cup out there and they would probably prefer the size when they are running the ball with Whittington versus Tutu Atwell. So I would go Whittington. Miami Dolphins, another team coming out of the bye. We have three straight here doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not getting Tua in week seven. We know that. Is there anything you actually want to see from this team? Uh, well, we have like Devon H. And he's, he, is he back from the concussion? Haven't heard either way there. Jalen Wright's post by rookie bump candidate. But yeah, none of it's really going to matter until we see Tua back Question. on the field. Mm -hmm. Rank these, and you did on the waiver show, but rank these. Blake Corum, Kamani Vidal, Jalen Wright. Uh, Corum for sure first, and then Vidal, and then Jalen Wright. Jalen Wright has like a maybe easier path to be like a what the hell flex play in bye weeks because it's like two ways that he can get on the field but i think that he, he's not going to have the bell cow profile that vidal and blake quorum would so i think like the upside case for the other two is way more obvious to me than with jalen wright i do think jalen wright looks really good and again mm -hmm. this is the perfect offense for him to succeed in but now that most hurts back this team is certainly not as successful on there between the yeah. tackles runs as they were last year. You can just look to all the offensive linemen they've lost with that. Um, yeah. But the off tackle outside in space stuff that Jalen Wright does. So he just utilizes athleticism. Mm -hmm. It's super good, but he'll play second fiddle to Devon H and, and all of that stuff too. And roast uh, Raheem Moser too. Like Raheem played a lot in week five. Right. Okay. Third team in a row off the bye week. It's the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, what do you want to see from them? Well, we got a hell of a matchup between them and the Lions, so I can't wait to watch that game here. We need Justin Jefferson to play in closer games for him to like fully take off, and like this should be a close game. I believe Vegas has the Vikings as one-point favorites over the Lions in this one. So, yeah, a closer game script for Justin Jefferson. like That would be pretty exciting. And then 
Um, Jordan Addison has been kind of hanging out there. Uh, big play threat, uh, lots of design stuff with Kevin O'Connell. So I want to see everything with the Vikings. Like probably my favorite team to watch offense and defense because the coaching staff's just so damn good. I don't know if we have any recent Aaron Jones news. It's so weird coming off a of bye week where, mm-hmm. you know, these injury reports, they don't have to say exactly what it is because they haven't practiced and so on and so forth. But that was a, that was a hamstring injury, but he is spotted on the practice field. The last time they checked, this was yesterday, according to Kevin Seifert, he was doing light work at practice. That's a hip injury right now. So we'll see. Um, that would be a massive loss for the team. I think it would make mm-hmm. them lean even more into the passing game. We've talked about Aaron Jones, even if he was getting 75% of work in one game or 55% in others, he was doing fantastic stuff inside the red zone. He was creating extreme explosive plays. Um, just super efficient. Ty Chandler, as much as I like him uh, as an athlete at the position, he's horrible in pass protection <laughs> and it's just not Aaron Jones, simply right. put. So uh, I think that they would have to change their game plan according to that. And Lions historically pass funnel. The run defense has been so right. good. We talked about their pass defense. So uh, I'm not going to be there for the wide receiver ranking show. Make sure Justin Jefferson, numero uno, though. It's going to be uh, the only person that's been able to run the lines this year is Kenneth Walker. New York Giants lead back Tyrone Tracy question mark. So we know we've gotten that in the last two weeks, but Devin Singletary, just because days and weeks go by, could be returning here in somewhat the near future. Uh, This is just one beat writer's opinion, okay? But this is Art Stapleton. Quote, after watching Tyrone Tracy the past two weeks, I think you'll see Devin Singletary have the Eric Gray role from last night, maybe with a little bit of jump and snaps to 70%, 30%, rather than 84 to 18%, with Tracy continuing as the lead back. Hayden, if we get 70% Tyrone Tracy the rest of the way, uh, I'm going to need new pants. Yeah, uh, this is possible. But um, as a reminder, Devin Singletary was leading the NFL in missed tackles, car- uh, missed tackles force per carry before his injury. So it's not like that Devin Singletary has played so bad. I watched Tyrone Tracy. I think the fun part about his profile is definitely a really good athlete. But in this last game, it was all the short yardage work. Like there was an, an option route that you saw with Daniel Jones. Good to see Daniel Jones out in space using, using his legs a little bit coming off the injury. But they were like under center. It's third and one. It's fourth and two. And they just ran the ball up the middle. Tyrone Tracy picked the right hole and he consistently pulled it off. So we didn't see like a bunch of like forced missed tackles in this game. But it just shows like a, a well-rounded like uh, skill set for Tyrone Tracy. Yeah. I mean, like the, he can. He caught a bunch of passes on the flats, was able to pick up some first downs there, but he was also used in the short yardage role. So I'm not going to go as far as, as Stapleton is, is suggesting here. I think Devin Singletary has too much trust with Brian Dayball, even going back to Buffalo, but you aren't taking Tyrone Tracy off the field. It's going to be a very 50-50 split, and the Giants probably aren't a good enough offense if it isn't your 50-50 to have either one of these guys as RB2s. But man, I've been super impressed with Tyrone Tracy like just moving forward. He's an NFL player. I feel very confident in that. He's a running back nine in points per game over these last two weeks combined. <laughs> I mean, hell yeah. This is what makes football fun. You know, mm-hmm. like I love watching the games each and every week, but when you go and watch these draft prospects and a guy gets taken in the fifth round and I understand his profile is questionable and they don't care about running backs anymore. And he was 24 years old or whatever and played one year at running back at Purdue. But then when you watch it and you see how he did break miss tackle or force yep. miss tackles at the college level, how he was a receiver here in this game, six targets, six receptions, all that type of stuff, and just created offense by himself. And then you, again, watch the draft and no one wants to draft this guy, select this guy, <laughs> and then has earned this spot and then looks amazing in it. There's like yeah. no feeling. There's no feeling that's better with mm-hmm. it. So I hope this lasts. Uh, at the very least, he's carved this into, I think, a 50-50 split. And my only note on those force missed tackles is that Tyron Tracy moves at a different speed than Devon Singletary. And uh, Devon Singletary might have to avoid those tackles on contact more often than Tyron Tracy does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've always wondered. Like, we're missing a stat for running backs. It's like 
just avoiding being touched is is like yeah. the, like the point of this average, like vision average distance sustained from nearest defender yes yes and like you have to remove it from the offensive line but there's just like some running backs that run right into the linebacker and there's other running backs that somehow navigate things and i think tracy's the latter pretty cool yeah i don't i don't think the art sableton thing's gonna happen where it's a 70 30 that would but, be rich i mean would be amazing at the very least, if we get a 50-50 here, or even like a 40-60, that's so much more. Mm -hmm. That's so much more than any of these backs we're getting into from Devin Singletary in the past. And I think they're going to have to rely on their running game a bit moving forward. I, I think I saw that Andrew Thomas is going in for an MRI. I don't know if we have any news on him moving forward, but that would that would change a lot of stuff. And hopefully we get Malik Neighbors coming back here too. Yes, so. please. And Theo Johnson, keep that name in mind. Uh, he is exactly how people should be viewing the tight end position in, in the NFL draft, uh, a day two athlete who kind of looked gangly and all over the place in college and didn't know what he was doing. And now, uh, as a check and release guy run after the catch, that's a, that's a guy whose game can grow the more years and the more reps he gets under his belt at the NFL level. I like it. Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> you have the bye week Then you have the Cleveland Browns. And I know that they won. And AJ Brown is awesome, but man, I went back and watched every single one of these dropbacks and mm. the offensive issues are still not solved. And they ended up having to pull the lever of AJ Brown, go win your one-on-one -on -one matchup. We're going to throw it to you. And that's our path to victory. And that's not what I want to see right now. Yeah. I mean, it was a beautiful slot fade cover one. Look, it's as easy as can be, but AJ Brown makes the play Devonte Smith gets uh open some yards after the catch stuff but yeah i i see the same thing like the success like down to down is not there they are, the entire season's just been explosive plays really like saquon barkley's provided that aj brown Demonte smith dallas goddard after the catch but like the down to down stuff it just does not seem like it's fully clicking i think that jalen hurts is just like regressed over the last couple of years. I think it's kind of safe to say I'm sure they're missing Kelsey um, a little bit. Jordan Maylotta, their the left tackle. He's injured now. Lane Johnson's been in and out of the lineup at times. So the offensive line and, and Jalen Hurts, that combination, plus Sirianni's too busy yelling at uh, the fans and not taking control of the offense. It's It's been questionable, but they are at least winning some, some close football games. But yeah, I wish that the Eagles looked better than they have looked. That's for sure. Positive spin on all of this is this is the portion of the calendar to figure it out. The New York Giants, the Cincinnati Bengals, the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Dallas Cowboys, the Washington Commanders, and the wow. LA Rams are their oh next six God. games. Think oh about God. those six defenses that if you can't get it right and if you can't score points, but this is part of the reason why mm -hmm. we were all hoping that you could trade for Jalen Hurts during this period. Again, you should win all those games, Philadelphia. You should put up 26 points per contest in each of those, 24 points mm -hmm. in each of those. Um, figure it out. Figure it out right now. Because uh, then later on after that, it gets it gets a bit more difficult. I mean, that is as easy as you can draw it up, though. So. And, and for, for the wide receivers, if Dallas Goddard is, is out weeks with a hamstring injury, I mean, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith are just going to be going absolutely crazy. Uh, last note I had is Jalen Hurts has been blitzed at the third highest rate of any quarterback on passing plays at 43%. So defenses are still testing him on how, if he has answers to those pressure looks or what's hot and what's not. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more difficult with Dallas Goddard out too. So that number might sustain itself. And Jordan Mailata reportedly out multiple weeks as Brutal. well at left tackle. San Francisco 49ers. We talked about this on the instant reaction show on Sunday night. He is doing, honestly, his best Travis Kelsey impersonation of giving you an edge on every other fantasy roster in your league. Again, right now, he's averaging 3.8 points per game more than the tight end two. And if we look down to, I don't know, the tight end, tight end seven, for example. Uh, no, tight end five, for example. He's over six fantasy points more yep. than that number. Uh, that's almost exactly the biggest gaps that Travis Kelsey ever gave you over the next closest tight end, albeit sometimes over those are 17 point seasons versus <laughs> yeah. a 14.5 point season. Yeah. My notes here, Kittle just very clearly the best tight end in the NFL right now that and Brock Purdy has been playing better football uh, this year. And it's kind of weird because like the offense isn't completely firing on all cylinders, but to me, like 
Brock Purdy is showing so much with this pocket movement. That out route to, to George Kittle was thrown right on time in the perfect exact spot. And there was also a nice dig route versus uh, zone coverage to, to Brandon Ayuk. So you're getting the timing with Brock Purdy, but you're also just getting more pocket movement from uh, Brock Purdy. So did want to shout him out, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. Like George Kittle has been the best skill player on the team pretty clearly this entire season. Ayuk, very inconsistent, more uh, bad than good. Debo Samuel in and out of the lineup. And then now with Jordan Mason dealing with a shoulder injury, it's it's pretty obvious. George Kittle's like the most important player uh, on the team right now, aside from Bosa and Williams. Thoughts on Isaac Grindo? Yeah. 18 of his 23 carries have been outside zone. A lot of those have been <laughs> pitches as well. This is exactly how he was used in college. This is uh, Devon Achan as a rookie. This is Jalen Wright. It's, you're dealing with the same exact uh, type of skill set with Garendo. I don't trust his vision per se, but fast guy with Trent Williams uh, out in space, like you can get some explosive carries here. So I think that if if Jordan Mason does miss and it is Isaac Isaac Garendo as a lead back, I think we're gonna get more Debo Samuel as the running back, which has been really good for Debo Samuel whenever he kind of has that like a hybrid running back wide receiver role. Um, I don't think they trust Isaac Garendo to be like the Jordan Mason because they could use all the run schemes so far. Isaac Garendo point him to the perimeter and hopefully he takes off. But we saw that work down the stretch. This will be the last time I cite this number in this episode. But San Francisco, we know last year led the NFL in red zone touchdown rate at 68%. This year, it's not even close to that. Uh, They are 25th in the league at 44%. Uh, a major part of it to me is we saw, I think in the first or second series this past Thursday was a red zone target for Jordan Mason. That just did not work. Think yep. about all those red zone targets that we got to Christian McCaffrey and those equaling touchdowns, either manufactured or making a person miss mm-hmm. is naturally a Christian McCaffrey target. It earn you more than a Jordan Mason yes. target. So I do wonder if they are able to script some cool plays to Debo Samuel more so in the red zone and inside the 10 and inside Mm -hmm. the five. And if that has anything up to it, because right now it's like George Hill in the red zone and that's about it. The 49ers also another kind of like point when we talk about regression in the off season and we know these players and teams are good, but when they like were so dominant, we still have to like note that the regression could be happening negatively. We see that with Brandon Ayuk, who was like what 11 yards per target, the most efficient EPA wide receiver, in the league completely falls apart. Devon Achan uh, with the Dolphins, the most uh, efficient player we've basically seen at running back, now one of the most inefficient running backs uh, this season. So like the year-over-year stuff can be so fluky with some of these efficiency stats. And Brandon Ayuk, I would say like my worst take of the offseason was like drafting him at the round two, three turn. That was just banking way too much on efficiency. He's never been the volume back or volume hog. And we're seeing it now. You remove some of the efficiency, and he's been like basically unplayable in fantasy. Ooh. I'm I'm probably more optimistic than you are, but I agree that the, the oh, I'll also start him. But like he's rich. had one yes. good game out of what five. Yes, yes. So uh, I agree. I agree, especially with his quarterback playing better too. Yes, uh, and I'm I've been pretty pilled since about his third start in the NFL, and it's pretty amazing what he's doing now. Okay, yes, Seattle Seahawks. Uh, this team, simply put, went from last in the NFL in plays per game last year to first in the NFL in plays per game this year. That's about Regression. a 10-play difference right now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's also new code. Yeah, yeah. Um, despite that, I mean, the the JSN efficiency or metronome just kind of isn't there. I think we kind of understand who he is as a talent now. Mm-hmm. And despite being the wide receiver one in his draft class, I mean, if you just lined up, <laughs> this is going to sound awful. He and DK Metcalf against the wall. And you were like, okay, which one of the guys is going to be the alpha mm-hmm. target mm-hmm. earner on this team? Who is it going to be? Yeah, it's going to be DK Metcalf. Duh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, that, that, and that was like kind of the concern with JSN. We never, nobody wanted to admit it, but we were talking about a slower slot only wide receiver as a prospect being the consensus wide receiver one. Now in this game, I've talked very highly of Geno Smith. Geno Smith missed JSN, just like missed him accuracy-wise multiple times. I thought JSN could have had a really big game in this last one, and Geno let him down. Like, usually it's kind of the other way around here. So um, I was pretty bummed watching that that Geno Smith game where I was like, hey, guys, 
like take Geno Smith seriously. And then of course in the prime time game, after saying that he has like his worst game out there. So uh, Seahawks, they're number one in wide receiver fantasy usage uh, over the last month of the season. That's been mostly DK Metcalf, but JSN is at least the wide receiver 22 in expected points this month. And I think that that will positively regress uh, over the next couple of weeks. This was prior to Thursday, so this might have changed. But I remember on the wide receiver ranking show, I pointed out that JSN actually has like a lower percent of the percent of his targets in the intermediate and downfield portion this year than he even did last year, wow. which I thought was kind of mm-hmm. tough to do. But uh, that's where we're at. Just quickly here on the um, Seattle Seahawks defense, um, they have not been good these last three weeks. But again, so much of let's say the first six or seven weeks is about who you've played and what they turn into and the bigger picture you look at them. The first three weeks of the season, they played the Miami Dolphins, the New England Patriots, and the Denver Broncos. And these last three weeks, it's been the New York Giants, the San Francisco 49ers, and the Detroit Lions. Now, you also mix in that you don't have your first-round pick and Byron Murphy at defensive tackle. You also lost Leonard Williams for one of those contests. You have a new defensive play caller, so on and so forth. So uh, this is why defense is less sticky than offense. Yes, very much so. You see uh, the Seahawks trade for a defensive tackle who lives in Jacksonville, is in London, and now like he's being shipped across the the world back to Seattle. So it's been a tough string out for uh, the defensive tackle. But they're trying on defense. They're like keep trying to find new bodies over there to run the scheme that they want. But they're just probably a year too early for the defense to kind of kick off. And we talked about this in the running back rankings, and I'll bring it up this week too. But Kenneth Walker, running back four on the year. Hell yeah. Uh, what oh, a yeah. year. Um, and a major part of this is now when he doesn't score a rushing touchdown, he now has receiving production. Yeah. Imagine that the man has 10 fingers, two hands can catch a football that's thrown in his direction. And that is adding to both his floor and his ceiling on a weekly basis. Now it turns out when you almost win the Heisman at Michigan state as a running back that you, you are a pretty good player and that there might be a little bit more to your game. Imagine that just one of the most electric playmakers in the league uh, actually being good. And we don't have to worry about how oh, he's just one of the least efficient runners in the league. Damn. Okay. Stop tweeting over. Tampa Bay Buccaneers begins. Talk about rushing. So they had 220 rushing yards in the second half. Very fitting when Rashad White doesn't play that you get both Bucky Irving and, and Sean Tucker, who was a running back one in points per game mm-hmm. in week six doing this. Uh, it was a big sizable shift and some might call it good coaching by Liam Cohen. The defense was playing well on the opposite end. The offense just had some unfortunate turnovers and things of the sort uh, and punt return touchdowns, but Baker Mayfield had 12 dropbacks in the second half of 45 in total. And again, that was despite losing at the start of halftime. And then again, they just relied on the running game and it, it took it to them. That game was on crack. I mean, what they there really was, was, there was so much going on in this one. Uh, one of my favorite things that was pointed out to me on, on a site that we will not mention in their Millie maker contest, Sean Tucker was 0.4% owned and he was the highest scoring player of anybody. Yeah. Sean Tucker out of nowhere. I mean, that's one of like the most unpredictable finishes you can possibly write up. And Bucky Irving also got home. So, I mean, I talked about this with, with, with Sam the other day. I just think that this offense is so beautifully constructed and they're trying to run the ball in different ways. They're passing the ball more in general and it's working. It also helps that Chris Godwin is taking underneath targets and trucking dudes for 50 yard touchdowns. That's going to help beautifully time for Chris Godwin in the contract season. But yeah, Baker Mayfield's playing solid football in general when he's not turning the ball over. But I do think that this offensive coordinator um, is is living up to the hype. And I think that he actually might be a step up over what Canales was providing this team last season. From the great Lord Reeves, Baker Mayfield with Liam Cohen is getting the ball out and leaning on yards at the catch. He has a 5.6 air yards per throw. 25% of his throws are 10 plus yards on the field. That's very short. 6.3%, 20 plus yards on the field. Wow. Those are all career lows. His time to throw is 2.48 seconds. That's the fastest of his career. 64% of his yards are after the catch. That's the highest rate of his career. So it's get the football Ooh. to your good players. And uh, I do wonder, I mean, even without Graham Barton, this team ran the football really well. And it would only be fitting, once again, for the Fantasy Football Collective to scream, bench Rashad White, to then this backfield turn into a running back trio. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, the coaching staff literally said this is probably going to be a three-headed monster, which is like <laughs> the worst case scenario for everybody. It's going to be hilarious, like when the Bucky Irving like uh, hype cycle turns out to be completely true. Rashad White stinks. Bucky Irving's uh, playing more physical than his profile suggests, and it doesn't matter because Sean Tucker is back in our lives here. I mean, that's just fantasy football for you. You can be right all the way until the moment, and then you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's life okay Tennessee Titans uh did not love the stat line that Calvin Ridley had eight targets zero catches so I had to go back I had to go in the lab immediately the first thing I did on Monday morning targets. was to go back and look <laughs> at these eight Calvin Ridley targets um here they were all right four of them no joke hit a defender's hand yeah or were intercepted and you can kind of like blame and share the blame with the rest. You know, who knows if it were bad routes, the timing of it, if Both. the football was thrown in the right time, where it was thrown to, any of that stuff. They were difficult ones down the field. So I understand that people can put out graphics and be like, oh, they paid a $750,000 for every single catch this year. That's kind of true. Uh, but at the same time, what really irritated me was what? four, five of these eight targets also happened in the fourth quarter. Um, we just got to, it's just got to work better from the first series. You know, like this is coming off of a buy. This one was supposed to be the player who could create the explosives for you, you know, and they just had no answer to open it in the opening script. And yeah. Titans fans are already pissed at Brian Callahan. I mean, it's the quarterback's fault, let's be honest here. And they're like 30th in pass block win rate as well. So the offensive line is failing. Will Levis is is failing. Yeah, some of those targets, like they should be targeted to nobody. They or Target the linebacker. Give the linebacker a damn target on, on some of those reps. So it's it's been pitiful. Um, I think some of those were bad routes from Calvin Ridley, but not all of them. Most of this is with Will Levis. So I'm, I'm curious how much longer they're going to try with Will Levis. I think at this point, I've seen enough and the Titans are going to be in the market for whatever quarterback kind of steps up uh, in the college ranks over the next couple of we weeks here. I think they should be moving DeAndre Hopkins um, shortly. We'll see, but the, this is just a dysfunctional offense. Like I, aside the Calvin really made that insane catch against uh, sauce Gardner, Jets. where yeah. sauce Gardner like still doesn't know that Calvin really caught that ball. But aside from that, there's been nothing in the past game. We're going sure. into Halloween. Did you see that Derrick Henry has more rushing yards than Will Levis has passing yards this year? I mean, <laughs> unbelievable, but believe I mean, honestly, believable, it, 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 actually extremely believable. <laughs> it is a Will Levis issue. It's a Brian Callen issue. It can be an offensive line issue. It's a Calvin Ridley issue. But like, again, that encapsulates everything that's going on with the one in four Tennessee Titans here yeah. at this moment. So, yeah. okay. Washington commanders to close this thing. I have some, insane numbers to look Hit at me. here. And the first one is from the great Richard Ebar. We always talk about how sacks destroy drives and your opportunities to score points mm -hmm. on that series for everyone, but the Washington commanders. Okay. Washington actually scores on average, the same number of points on drives where they have no sacks at 3.24 as they do with a sack on Jeez. that drive at 3.23. Look how much of an outlier that is compared to everyone else. <laughs> the next That's closest unreal. team when they take a sack on that drive is the Cincinnati Bengals at 1.86. Now there are a couple theories here. One, obviously the explosive plays and how good the offense has been right now. Two, maybe these sacks aren't six yard losses. They're one yard losses or two yard losses by Jane Daniels. But just as a whole, as sweet as this is, you don't want to live in this world for the rest of the season. Uh, it can work for six weeks. It's tough for that to work for 16 weeks, but I don't even want to think about that. That's just one of the most insane numbers I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. You just don't see like outliers to that level versus the entire league, but this offense, man, is just like everything's firing. Like even this game, they lose like the Baltimore Ravens, just a, a more veteran team, better defense. Certainly Jaden Daniels still looked really good. Cliff Kingsbury looked awesome. Terry McLaurin, same thing. Jaden Daniels leading the NFL in EPA and completion percentage over expected. They're sixth in success rate. But there was like four plays with Terry McLaurin on his 
uh, catches. This last game that kind of caught my attention, we had like a little mini motion into like a kind of a pick play for a touchdown against man coverage. Cool concept. We saw a fake bubble screen in trips. Then you get Terry McLaurin. He's kind of leaking out wide open, takes a huge hit, catches that. We have a back shoulder touchdown at the goal line that Terry McLaurin wins out. And then we have play action under center zone coverage over the middle. Jaden Daniels winning. The commanders are kind of throwing like a lot of different things at you. And you kind of see like a new addition every single week. So I know they lost this game, but I was extremely impressed with Jaden Daniels, Cliff Kingsbury and Terry McLaurin, uh, even in a loss. This isn't the same offense they were running in week one. This isn't the same Agreed. offense that they were running in, in week two. And they've been, you know, they're four and two. So they've been a winning team throughout. But it's awesome that even when they were winning those games or close in those games, that they're not just running the same thing on a weekly basis, that they are upgrading, that they are leveling up. They're doing all the things that we want them to. And Cliff is even doing uh, things that he wasn't doing back in Arizona or USC or Texas Tell me Tech about or it. any of these places, <laughs> you know? Um, final stat here of the day. 53.5% of Washington's plays have been considered no huddle by PFF this year. The next closest team is the Chicago Bears at 27.4%. So they're keeping you in defensive personnel groupings. They're keeping you in certain looks and they are just, wow, dominating you in, in the mm -hmm. personnel packages and looks that they, they, that they want to. And that's not good when the defense that's going to have to stop them this week is the Carolina Panthers in week seven. Oh man. Oh man. Start everybody. <laughs> Start. Oh, Ben Sinat. I would like to see Ben Sinat on this offense. He showed some flashes, really oh. athletic tight end and like this kind of screen game. Let's see a little bit more Ben Sinat, less Zach Ertz. That would be like the only uh, thing I would change about Washington right now. And I, we'll talk about this in the running back ranking show this week with Ray, but if Brian Robinson returns, I would still push to start Austin Eckler too. Like, yeah. again, this Panthers backfield is giving up 25 rushing points per game. I believe, I believe Derrick Henry leads the NFL with something like 15 rushing points per game. So, or 18 rushing points per game. So you're getting a Derrick Henry plus performance on an every week basis of running backs facing the Panthers. And Eckler has been like on a per touch basis, like one of the most efficient yep. running backs in the damn NFL. All right. Good shot. That does it. Before we get out of here, this is our longest stats versus film of the year. Who would have known? Some massive contracts, some massive trades, and some new quarterbacks would take us here. Before we get out of here, uh, you support us. Thank you so much. Hitting that subscribe button, thumbs up. We know this is a weird por portion of the calendar for fantasy football where some people drop away. We appreciate everyone who tunes into this episode. And go support Underdog because they allow us to have this award-winning program for all of you. Use promo code the show, or just click the link in the description down below and play pick'em. Do Battle Royale drafts every single week. It is the place to play while watching football, basketball, baseball, esports, whatever suits your fancy. Promo code the show for Hayden, for Winks. I'm Josh, up the bell. We'll talk to y'all soon. See ya. <laughs>